I'm not going to get much light from there. It's raining. <sighs> rain, rain, go away. <laughs> Just kidding. We need it bad here in Southern California. So I just need it to fill up my pool. <laughs> so I don't have to pay for that. Yeah, I know you're all wondering where I was. I should probably go to Discord and say, hey, I'm alive now. Uh, let's see, where's Discord? There it is. Such a lag for the chat. Everybody. All right. <laughs> hey, Ollie. Oh. A little dark in here. We have to get my uh, little miniature movie light and put it in front of me. Yeah, Gary, I was just talking to my friend who lives uh, up in up nor northern Wisconsin. He's been up there for a long time. And yeah, he's he's starting <coughs> he started to do um, uh, tapping trees, you know, for uh, sap. Uh, oh, thanks. Appreciate that, Holly. Um, and because he said there was one winter that it didn't get above zero in January in January for for the like except one day of the month so you got total cabin fever so he needed something to do and that was like seven years ago he said and he uh, uh, that's when he started uh, making maple syrup <laughs> so, that was that's what I would do if I was up there I guess yeah I didn't set my alarm I never do I never, except on Sunday mornings, and because I never sleep past seven, and I slept almost all the way to nine o'clock. But I, you know, I had to get my coffee, so that's <laughs> coffee. Coffee is Starbucks. Starbucks is priority over you guys. I'm sorry. <laughs> Starbucks is priority over my kids. So, and, and you're kind of like my kids. So, so uh, yeah. So I'm sorry, but that's just the hard, cold, the warm, wet reality of it all. <laughs> so. Um, the, uh, and then also I hadn't done this graphic, the, my graphics for today. And I, I, um, I didn't do it in yellow, but it's all right. I'm just doing it. <laughs> uh, so I had to do those and the, this, these graphics are kind of complex and I, I'm doing it kind of in a weird way using basically Microsoft word. It's pages, which is the Apple version of Microsoft word. So, um, Yeah, and I've got a Discord link up there. So if anybody's not part of the Discord group, um, you can join that for free. It doesn't cost anything. And um, all the diagrams that I create um, in all the lessons, all the PDFs, all of the um, songs that we that I write for you guys, uh, they're all up there for free at this point. So until we decide to... Um, until we decide to, to, to turn it to profit for the for the... Discord team. <laughs> so. Thanks for, uh, Bruce uh, texted me. Like, everybody's waiting. 
Oh, hey, Max. Good to see you. Jack Lloyd. John, why? Well, yeah, I haven't seen you in a couple of week, a couple of weeks. Um, off from work. Oh, and running around getting things done. Okay. Well, do, you make sure you do that. Um, and uh, those days off, that's when you get all those things done. So it's a, it's a, always it's always important to have a day off. So uh, let's see. I posted that video um, on the Apex thing. Everybody take a sip because I play all the guitars on Apex. When did I post that? Was that has that been a while now? October twenty first. Oh no. Okay, so that was that was uh, Thursday. I mean, it's already got five hundred, almost five hundred views. Um, the thing is, is that Stephen tweeted it, and so did the voice of Fuse tweeted it. Um, so that got a lot of n notice. I, that the tweets got a lot of views on Twitter. Um, and uh, so it got we got some new subscribers from it. Actually, we jumped up about a hundred subscribers in a couple days, which is good. Um, let's see. Uh, hey, Jack Lloyd, transplanted Hoosier, just like me. Although I was transplanted so long ago, my roots are pretty much my kids were all born in California. So, and my daughter's moving back to the West Coast, not uh, California, but she's moving to Spokane, Washington, in a couple weeks. So she and Beth and her best friend will be driving a truck, towing her car up across the country. And I'm like, uh, we'll see. And they're like, oh, we can get it done in this many hours. I'm like, yeah, that, that truck's not going to be going 75 with a car towed behind it. <laughs> so you're going to be going, you're going to have semis behind you, like frustrated. But... Anyway, it's going to be interesting. Hey, Randall from Florida. You're welcome. Steve Barry. Hey, Rosalind. Good to see you. Connecticut. My sister lives in Connecticut. Uh, Eastern Connecticut. She teaches at Rodon School Design. Same last name, so you could probably find her. Um, oh, you did watch the last... Okay, thank you. Thank you, John. John's still debating whether I want to get the, the crowns yet or not. I don't have any issues with my teeth, but they they say I need crowns. I'm like, really? Or they say I should get them. I don't know. One, doc one doctor said, I went to my old the dentist I had for 30 years, and he said, nah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so we're going to do more of this on the, the cage method. Um, so just a quick review. The cage method is a, is a method of learning the fretboard, um, memorizing um, shapes up and down the fretboard, particularly uh, scale shapes, but also chord shapes um, for rhythm playing and for lead playing. Um, I use it without even thinking about it anymore. It's just kind of like, it's just like speaking uh, anymore. I just kind of, it just naturally happens. Um, and um, so the, the whole system is based on five basic open chords, C, a, G, E, and D. And um, we started out with, um, you just take those shapes and start moving them up and you go, oh, okay, this is C, this is F, this is G. And there's scales, there's a pentatonic scale right there for the F major pentatonic where I could do F my major diatonic. It's right there, or if I want to do blues. Do the A minor or the F minor pentatonic right there, and and so they're they're all right there on the shape. So if you're if you can find that shape, those scales should line up really easily, and it should help you start to navigate some what I like to call boundaries for soloing. I, I, those aren't solos. None of that was soloing. Those were just scales. Scales are are not soloing. Um, even solo scales. I don't even think scales so much when I'm soloing. I, I more think chord shapes. Like I see this F chord, and if I want. To, I almost more think scale or chord shapes than I think scale tones. I'll think 
uh, chords and maybe notes related to it. Like here's a five of the chord. See, and I'll go five, six, one. That's I'm thinking. I'm more thinking when I play that lick. I'm not thinking. Okay, that's the five, six, one of the F major scale or the F major pentatonic. I'm more thinking it's just a little chord shape here, and I'm playing the the, the fifth and the root, and I'm hammering on the the sixth. Okay. Um, so, but but the cage method will get you going up and down the fretboard. Okay. And so we've we've done um, just a quick review. I find that reviews are actually really really good because in the, I try to make it so even in every single review. Um, you're you're gonna learn. <laughs> you're gonna. Go, I may say something different, and you, or I may say something a different way, and a light bulb may go on for somebody. So, um, these are the five shapes, and what we did when we did these was we we played them with our first three fingers, okay. Then we played them with our these three fingers, freeing up our God given capo, and then we capoed up and down. And again, I've said it a million times. You don't need to be able to play the G four as a capo up and down. If you can, great. You might use it. I don't really ever use it, but if you can do that, it means you got some serious dexterity, it's finger strength. Uh, but it's not critical. It's more critical to be able to see that shape. If I can see this B flat shape here, boy, there's that B flat major pentatonic. Okay, it's right there. The B flat major major scales right there too. All right. Um, so that was the first day, and then the next day we started to, uh, well, I, sh I wrote all those shapes out, uh, the five different shapes, um, starting in open position. So we had the C, and then, so these were all Cs here. Here's the C, that first uh, diagram, and then here's the A form C, and here's the G form C, and here's the E form C, and here's the D form C. And so I just put those in the black notes, kind of fill in the gaps. Uh, usually roots and fifths, I think. I don't see any thirds, yeah. And I did the same thing with the A. We did the A shape all the way up to, up and down the fretboard. And then we did the G shape, all the G, all the iterations of the G shape using the, the five, pen, or five uh, cage method shapes. Okay, that was the next day. Okay, the next day we started to dive into it and show, uh, I, I showed you, we took, we took a shape, we moved it up the fretboard a little bit. In this case, we took the C shape up two frets uh, now we're in D, and uh, so here we were in D. So you can go back and watch these videos if you missed them. Um, and this one I have as cage number uh, 12, I think, because uh, that's my screen numbers. Oh, wait, I have a zero. What's zero, though? Cage zero is just a blank screen. Yeah, so that's just me talking. Um, so then, so we did, we started doing the shapes, and I showed you a major and a minor pentatonic, Okay. And there's the there's the A shape or the A form, and there the major mi major pentatonic, the the major diatonic and the major pentatonic. There's the G form. We learned two scales there, are actually three scales, but just two different ways to play the major diatonic. So don't be confused. Uh, here we had the E form, which is one we're going to work on today, and we're going to relearn that major pentatonic. We're going to re we're going to Restate. I'm going to restate all that. We're going. To, we're not going to do diatonic. We're just to do the pentatonic. And there's the e, G major. Uh, that's a G major chord, but it's E shape. Okay. See, see if you can see the E shape in there, right? You see that? All right. And that's the most common bar chord. Um, there's the D shape moved up in there. We did F. So this was F major pentatonic and F major diatonic. And then uh, this was from my lesson uh, that I did. Um, this was the graphic from the pentatonic shapes that I did, the five pentatonic shapes. How's that lesson doing? A uh, thousand, not bad. It just, I need to have a lot more views. You know, I'm trying, I'm trying to find that magic bullet that I'm trying to find, catch, catch lightning in a bottle again. All of you are here because of seven tips for older beginners. Okay, and here I did, uh, now here's where we started what we're gonna do today. Here, I, I just, I don't know why I started on the G shape, I just did. I, it's stupid. I should have started on the C, but I started on G. Uh, I forget what I did next. But we are going to finish the, with E today and D next week. So uh, we're, we're kind of back in order now. But what I did here was I showed you a major pentatonic and a minor pentatonic. And I, I didn't really have my graphic concept down. I think I have it a little bit more down now. Oops, here we go. Uh, there's 
Yeah, I, again, I still don't have – so So this was last week's uh, – this is A. So I did – in order, I did G shape, I did the C shape, and I did the A shape. So I did them all out of order. I apologize. But today, we're, we're going to actually do the E shape, okay? So – and that's part of the reason why I was late. Part of the reason I was late was because I uh, just freaking overslept, which never happens. I usually get up at 7 without fail. Um even if I went to bed at six, <laughs> sadly. Um, and, but today I got, it was like 8.41 when I grabbed my phone to look at what time it was. And I was like, well, okay. I didn't even panic. I was like, eh, what am I going to do? I got to get my coffee and I still got to do that graphic. So these, for some reason, the way I'm doing this graphic, it took me like 25 minutes. I'm like, uh, way too long. Hey, Quail, good to see you again. Uh, -dum -bum -bum. Good morning. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. That's good. Oh, hey, sure. Uh, Shri, wow, what is that name? I'm guessing Indian? From India, I mean? Kumar. I'm going to say Kumar. Because that I probably am closer to. Oh, you're, oh, okay. There you go. Um, all right. So, moving on. Um, let's let's review. Let's get the let's get that G major. Uh, here I have it right here. Yeah. All right. I'll go a little skinnier on this. All right, so there's the G major pentaton um, laying on top of. I didn't. I didn't uh, put the the. You can just look back and forth between those two and kind of get the um, the gist. But let's go ahead. And, we're going to do the G major pentatonic. So uh, if you want, play this G chord. You can bar chord. All right, and it, just notice again. This is part of what I want you to see is we're visualizing, we're using these shapes to start to visualize the fretboard, okay? And if you'll notice, look at this chord shape and look at the G major pentatonic. 50% of the notes in that G major pentatonic scale are in this chord. So you already, by playing this chord alone, you already have 50% of that scale. Does that make sense? Can you see it? Can you visualize that? Do you see that? The sixth string and then the note on the fifth string and the fourth string, third string, first string, you can see that. So all you have to do is really fill in the missing notes and you have a pentatonic scale. And we're going to do that right now. Um, but that's what you should be doing on all of these because that's really the whole point is to is to get to the place where, okay, I need some G licks. I'm playing over a G chord or I'm playing over a B flat chord. You know, so you bring this up to B flat and I've got, a, I've got all the scales. Right there over the B flat chord. You know, those scales all travel with the shapes, which is great. All right. Yeah, I don't know how you do it either, Dennis. <laughs> You're on a phone. Can you cast it to the TV or something? Of course, then I'd probably, you know, where's Catherine? Catherine's not on yet, is she? Okay, well, let me know when Catherine's on, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna get real close to the camera. So I'm really, because Catherine tends to watch me on her like 900 inch TV. Um, all right, so, so let's get this. We're gonna put our second finger here on the bottom string on the third fret. Okay, so we're gonna be technically what's called second position, meaning our first finger is gonna get the second fret. Okay, it's going to be assigned to the second fret. So we put second finger, and so three, and then five with the pinky. And this one I would pretty much play this way. I might do a little slight change, uh, but we talk about the academic way of playing scales. I would probably play it pretty academically here. So, so two, four, and then second fret, fifth fret, second fret, fifth fret, second fret, fourth fret with the third finger. 
Okay, well, now, I, what did I just say? I would, uh, academic. No, generally I, on this one, you're right. I would play, I would finish off oftentimes with these two, but we're going to do it academically for now. So second, four, I'll explain what I mean by that in a second. And then, and then two, four, meaning fingers. The third fret, fifth fret, third fret, fifth fret. Okay, let's go backwards. Fifth fret, third fret, fifth fret, third fret, fourth fret. So I'm just waking up stuff. Uh, second fret. Five, two, five, two, five, three. Okay. And you can practice that a bunch of different ways. I, I, I think, um, Holly, one of my next um, Solo 101 lessons is going to be about making your own patterns or making patterns to practice. It's going to require a lot of graphics, though. I mean, a lot of finale. Um, so this is, you can do a lot of things. Now, um, like I said, that, academically, that's the way I would finger it. That's like, oh, that's the proper prim prim and proper way. But in, when the rubber meets the road, when we're actually soloing, we're probably not going to go 2-4-2-4 two, four, two, four on the top of that scale. We're probably going to move our hand up. In fact, we might not even play the bottom part of that scale at all. We might only play the top part. I mean, I always talk about Steve Ray Vaughan. He always used this, this pentatonic scale to create that E minor. In this case, if you play G major pentatonic over an E chord, it's going to be E minor pentatonic, and it's going to create a blues sound. We've talked about that. Oh, Catherine is here. Yay! Hey, Catherine, how's it going? Huh? What's what? What are you doing? You going to clean up those that mess behind you? <laughs> She's like, you're such a, I'm such a brat. Okay. Uh, does the first finger make it? My, uh, uh, Dan, uh, that is. With pentatonic number one, uh, with, yeah, it, let's see. With pentatonic number one is the first one we learned. If you line the first finger up, it doesn't yeah, it doesn't always correspond. In fact, on this one, the uh, E is not until here. So I guess if you're talking about this first finger, yeah, on the fourth string, yeah, if you line that note up with uh, any major chord you're going to, and play this scale, it's going to be a minor pentatonic over that, okay? I'm, I'm going too fast for some people. I'm going to show you. So here's the scale I'm playing. The one that's written right there, the G major pentatonic. I'm going to stop on that note. That note right there is the minor root of that scale. Okay? And if I play, if I line that up with E, like it is, and I'm playing over E blues, or even like if I'm playing over like a, a let's say an R&B song that's just an E7. And I play this scale, it's going to sound bluesy and, and it's going to have a couple notes that rub in the wrong direction, but that's what creates the blues tonality, um, having that flat third against the major third. Um, and so, um, <laughs> I'm your baby brother, I, I doubt it, I'm, just, I'm older than you, Catherine. I'm your big brother. Big brothers are just as bad as little brothers. I know because I was both. I was both a big brother. I am both a big brother and a little brother. I am mess shaming, yes. Yeah. Really, I have no right to do that. <laughs> I'm a hypocrite, though. I, I admit it. So, all Christians are hypocrites because... <laughs> Because we aim to be like Christ and none of us are. So, yes, all of us are hypocrites. So, um, so yes, in some way, uh, bu -bu 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 Dan, um, that's, uh, if that's what you were referring to. Um, I, but oftentimes when I think first finger blues, blah, 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 I'm thinking pentatonic number one. And so whatever note this is, and you play pentatonic one from there, that's going to be the minor pentatonic. And um, if I want to play blues and B flat, which is very, very common if you're playing with a horn section, 
then I just put my first finger on on the B flat and I go go to town on that minor pen, the the pentatonic number one. Might want to add that flat five. Or... Crossland. Ladies need to stick together. When I taught a clinic at uh, on worship leading at USC, <laughs> I kid you not, at USC School of Music in Los Angeles, um, I had 12 people at my clinic. And I was kind of bummed. I was like, really, 12 people? They said, no, the average is three. They said that my clinic was the second highest attended clinic that year <laughs> behind Pat Metheny, who had like 60. I'm like, okay, well, I don't feel so bad. I was number two to Pat Metheny. But the... Um, the uh, uh, the 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 thing that made it really interesting was that half of the attendees were girls, and it was in the guitar department where there's like one girl in the whole was one girl in the whole program, um, and uh, they uh, and people kept looking in the window like, what's going on here? <laughs> what's he teaching? Why are there girls on our floor? All the guitar players start getting nervous. <laughs> start sweating in the palms and everything. Oh, there's a girl. There's a girl. What's that? What do we say? So I try not to be that way. <laughs> All right. So uh, <clears throat> G major pentatonic. But I'm already digressing and, do, and playing the G minor. I mean, the, the uh, hybrid thing. Okay. Now. Uh, to kind of go full circle with what uh, Dan was saying, we're going to, the, the G minor pentatonic scale, which is the next scale I'm going to drag in here, and we're going to do that one, is pentatonic number one. All right. Here, here it be. Look at, glory be. Look at that. Where's the corner? Oh, here it is. I'm going to do something like that. That looks okay. I don't know. I'm going to go a little smaller. Okay. Now, I didn't write roots. I didn't put any of that kind of stuff on here. Um, apologize for that. But you can see it's right there, third fret. So play. this is our favorite pentatonic scale. Thirty-two watching. Not bad. I should start at nine thirty from now on. <laughs> so. The reason I start at nine instead of eleven is just because nine tends to end. Oh, God bless you, Joe. Thank you so much. Nine tends to end at uh, eleven, whereas t eleven tended to end at one. And I was like, "There's my day. <laughs> I'm done. Can't get anything done." So, I, I'll I'll go to work after this. So. Um, and by go to work, I'm probably just mean sitting here <laughs> and writing music. I don't have the keyboard on, but yeah. Uh, I'm gonna do some Arabian music. Okay, so pentatonic number one you got. Uh, I mean, the G major pentatonic we went through. Okay, so now put your first finger on G, and uh, we're gonna go one, we're gonna go third fret, sixth fret, three, five, three, five, three, five, three, six, three, six. If you want, go back to the three there to end on the root, that's a G. Okay, that's one thing you should try to learn when you're playing scales is know where the roots are, just so you have good landing spots. Uh, so if you do a lick, you can kind of end on the root. You don't want to end every riff that you play on the root. That's going to be a little boring after a while. Um, but doing it enough so that people know that you know <laughs> what key you're in, that's why you do it. <laughs> But, you know, end on a fifth, end on a third. Sounds great. You know, end on the seventh. Okay. Now, uh, this, both of these scales would work fine over, over a, a G, G blues context. One's going to sound happy, kind of, you know, like, like a country rock song or country blues. Even BB King would use that six. We talk about that all the time. He would take this. He would take this standard pentatonic and and take that seventh down to the six. Uh, don't really play it down there very often. He would. Just, so. Um, uh, hey, 
Bob's. Bob's New York, what's going on? Glory. Wow, we got a lot of people, a lot of new faces. Frank, what the heck? Do you exceed two octaves for purpose of flow? Two octaves. I'm not sure. Of the scale? Uh, I just want to show you the whole fretboard in that position. So I want how every note in that position in the pentatonic. Okay. So uh, let's play this descending. Let's go, and I'll, I'll give you fingers this time. Pinky. So we're at the third third fret. We're in third position. Our first fingers assigned the third fret. So ergo, we are in third. What's called third position. And that's classical guitar terminology for the most part. But um, okay, we're gonna go pinky first, pinky first, third first, third first, third first, pinky first. Now. Uh, remember what I had you do before. I had you play the G chord, if you could, and notice that um, those six notes represent 50% of the 12 notes in that G major pentatonic. Literally, 50% of that G major pentatonic scale is right here. You're playing it right there. Okay? So, playing the scale, the major pentatonic, you're just filling in the gaps, kind of, between all those major uh, roots and thirds and, and fifths. Okay? Uh, the G minor pentatonic doesn't really do that, okay? Uh, we have the power chord there. We got the roots and the fifths. So the roots and fifths line up. So by playing the G major power chord, we have five of the 12 notes in the G minor pentatonic. We have, where where it, it, it gets off is here and here, okay? We have those two notes in the minor pentatonic, and there's where the rub is, okay? So if we're, if we, if we were to play the, the B and the B flat together, it sounds like that. Now, when you play it like that, it, it, it sounds wrong. Although I like that. I love that sound. Um, I, you like, sometimes I'll be doing that. Over the G chord, I love that. You know, creating that weird flat nine, uh, see, the sharp nine, 13 chord, whatever that is. But it's just fun to Travis pick. Somebody asked me to do the Travis pattern. We've talked about the Travis pattern. It's really, really, really hard to teach finger picking this way. I really almost need you right in front of me to do that. Freebird's in the house. Um, so, um, so now what we're going to do is we're going to add those two notes together. So again, I already pointed out that the G's and the D's, the roots and the fifths, are common between these two scales, right? Um, so when we create a hybrid scale, all we're doing is we're we're kind of adding to our uh, lexicon of good notes, okay, of fair game notes, uh, especially in a blues context. Uh, but you can, I can play. We've done it. We do blues. I do G minor pentatonic. Works totally fine, even if we're in a very very G major. Um, uh, very happy G major. Bluegrass players do it all the time. It's, it's the blue of bluegrass. Um, but uh, even if we're like in a jazz context, like a like if I were to transpose the George Benson song uh, "Breezing" to the key of G. would play over that, he would play some major licks, and he would play some minor licks. He would go, he would do, you know, uh, he would go back and forth between major and minor, like, uh, he just does it so, flu it's so smooth when he does it. He kind of is sadly responsible for smooth jazz. <laughs> I blame him. And I'm a huge George Benson fan, and I hate smooth jazz, okay? <laughs> so, sorry any smooth jazzers out there. Um, but he is 100% to blame. I, I really feel like if you chart the um, progress of jazz, uh, and you go back to Dixieland, you know, Scott Joplin playing the piano and improvising. Beethoven, I mean, Bach improvised. Uh, so improv improvisation is nothing new. But jazz kind of, you know, you, go, you can go back to, to, uh, to Scott Joplin and, and the, you know, that style. Um, and then quickly into D 
Dixieland, kind of merged into Dixieland. And then that kind of merged into swing and then swing into bebop and then the bebop into cool. And it, every about 10 or 15 years, jazz changed. And, um, and a lot of times, a lot of players would be left behind. They couldn't handle the new change. You know, some players, like someone who could handle the change was uh, Coltrane. He could do the, uh, the, the uh, bebop, no problem, and the swing. Um, and then he, he got into cool, no problem, and then the experimental. Um, and also Miles Davis. Charlie Parker sadly didn't live long enough to really go beyond bebop. I think he died at 55. Um, so, uh, that, but all of that was kind of constantly, uh, you know, it was constantly growing, reinventing itself. Um, and jazz wouldn't probably exist if it weren't for the capability of recording. Um, jazz would probably exist, but it'd be in pockets. You'd have to go to country, you know, go to different cities to hear different types of music, but there wouldn't be a whole lot of, uh, growth and speed in that but recording allowed it to be captured these live solo performances captured and then you had to move on to the next thing okay well then what happens george benson came out with breezen and uh it sold millions no jazz record ever sold as much as breezen did i mean not even close you know uh what's the kind of blue uh yeah not even close so uh uh, yeah, I'll play the G major. Oh, G major scale? Um, uh, yeah, I can, I, can, uh, I can play the G major scale. I, I, uh, I will show you that. I can, we can go back to that because I have that on a previous lesson. I can, I can go back to that slide. Uh, but what I'm going to show you is the hybrid scale. But anyway, I'm talking about George Benson. So, yeah, I feel like that was when, you know, Breezen, but mostly this masquerade, that's when uh, Jazzer suddenly realized, wait, we can make money doing this? Because they weren't before. And um, it was funny because I was watching a Beato interview with Pat Metheny. He sold 800 copies of his first record and 700 of his second record. <laughs> and yet EMI or e ECM kept him on. It was like amazing. You know, he's like, yeah, I don't know. It was I, they gave me a second chance. I can't believe it. And then the second chance didn't do as well as his first. Um but, uh, I mean, for me, the groundbreaking one for him was Pat Metheny Group. And there was an example of one of the few jazz musicians that actually stuck true to the form. What he did was, because big thing in the 50s and 60s was combining jazz with Latin music or with Brazilian bossa novas and things like that. And then what Pat Metheny did was something that no one had done, which was combining jazz with almost like country music or folk music or, you know, just he even talks about this in the interview where it's just like strumming is one of the, like the coolest thing. The guitar is the greatest. You just show up at a campfire and start playing songs. It's like, that's the perfect milieu for the guitar. And, um, he, he talks about that. And, um, and that's exactly what he kind of brought in. You know, when you think about, uh, when you think about, uh, uh the song James, He, that song is, I didn't know what it was named for James Taylor, but that's what he was, he was trying to write a song, it was this, what was it? He was just trying to write something that was kind of folky, and it's actually one of his biggest songs, it's a really fun song, I don't know if you know James by Pat Metheny. Anyway, okay, so we're going to talk about, so George Benson would go back and forth between major and minor, or a lot of players do, not just George Benson. Blues players do in particular, country players, rock players. Okay, so now I'm going to drag the hybrid scale in. And Dan, uh, uh, Freebird, I haven't forgotten about you. I'm going to I'm going to come back and we're going to learn the major uh, the major scale, or I'll, I'll show you the major scale. I'm um, also now that I've got this window open with these, drag the right thing. Okay, so here's so basically what I did was I combined the black scale with the blue scale, and I got this hybrid scale. All right. Make it as big as I can. Um, okay, I'm going to Discord. I'm going to drag all... Ah! Where is Tom's lesson PDFs? Okay, 
So how I'm going to drag all these there, uh, these three. So like I said, if you if you want to get these diagrams and kind of create your own, excuse me, um, your own. <clears throat> Uh, okay. You want to create your own uh, kind of worksheet of scales and things like that. Uh, you can totally do that. Okay. Now, just so you know, this is not a scale I, I would suggest. It's not like uh, Freebird. You're gonna, you know, you're gonna want to learn the major scale. Okay. You're going to want to learn how to play that. That's great. You're going to want to know that. You don't need to memorize this scale. Technically, I could have added that note up there, but um, the, hey, holy cow, Pepper, you just nonstop homework. Uh, I've only been on since 930. I got a late start today, so, because I was, um, I overslept, <laughs> which I never do. Yeah, Holly's going to do the paperwork for us. She'll put it together in one. Mm. Holly, let me, you know, if you want to do, uh, I mean, I can drag that, the G, the, the first one, the yellow one there, too, in there. I mean, those are, that should already be up there, but, but again, it's, oh, here it is. Um. That if you want that to, to add to the the problem is it's yellow it's gonna, not going to show up very good on a black and white okay no so so the the thing is I don't want you to memorize this hybrid scale that's not the that's not the point of this what I want you to do is I want you to, I want you to memorize these other two I want you to see those and then realize that that both of those scales are good and you can play them both at the same time you can go back and forth like for example do this go okay so we got on the second string, third fret, first finger, third finger on the fifth fret, on the first string, first finger, and then pinky. Okay, so we're combining the second string of the G major pentatonic with the first string of the G minor pentatonic. Okay, that's something BB King would do all the time. Um, and so you can just play around with those notes. If I played uh, the G major pentatonic and the G minor pentatonic, and I combined those, I would end up would end up with this kind of very Dorian sounding. Uh, don't worry, there won't be a quiz on that. Take a sip. No quiz on Dorian. But the um, it will. I should create a kind of a G a, a G vamp real quick. So we can do that here. What tempo do I have? Oh, I got a slow tempo. Just need a piano. Any piano will do. Okay. I'll speed it up, but two, three. That's all I need, really. <laughs> is that, did I get, is that three bars? That's two bars. Okay. And I just go to a faster tempo. It's going to be kind of annoying because it's going to be the same chord over and over and over again. Let's see what happens when I quantize. That's fine. Okay. What's the tempo? Should What tempo should we go? Uh, I don't know. One, oh, eight. What does that sound like? That's good. So I'll play the over the G, G 
G7 chord. That's what's playing here. It's G7. Oops, you gotta get rid of the Discord. Hold on. There we go. feels too slow. I'm going to go 112 maybe. And I could add a drum to it. <laughs> a beat. Add a beat. Three hours later, I got a whole track ready to go. Uh, let's see. Uh, 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 let me just go to loops here. Um, instrument. It's got a load of all. Drums, genre, jazz. Okay, let's see what we get. Nah. All these are going to be too loud. I'm going to turn this down. Uh, just something like this. That fast. There we go. That'll do. You know what? You know what we need now is an upright. <laughs> it's funny because that's swinging. So I'm added a drum here, but I. Yeah, I can hear it swinging, so I'm gonna I'm gonna quantize it so it's not swinging. That's gonna sound a little. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I'll get rid of this snare head. That one's annoying. All right, so that's. So I'm just editing MIDI right now. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, We now we need a bass. <laughs> I'm gonna put a bass in here. I'm just gonna put an upright bass. Uh, let's see, uh, bass, here we go. Upright studio bass, that'll do. That's so stereotypical. It's gonna, yeah, let's see. <laughs> so all I did was kind of climb up a G scale, but added a couple notes. All right, so there's our jam. There's my jam. All right, where are you guys? Oh, there you are. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> okay. Oh, shoot! I have to go back to the to start it. There we go. So I'm going to play G major pentatonic first. So, you can... so you've heard stuff like that. It's happy jazz. I'm going up for that B note, not the seventh fret. It kind of almost sounds like a Stevie Wonder song. G major pentatonic. Now I'm going to play just G minor pentatonic. See, that's cooler, right? And now you got a cigarette in your mouth. Oh shoot, now I now I can't be Holly, now that I said cigarette in your mouth, I can't be child. I have to put a warning label on my video. <laughs> I 
could add the blues note in there. Supposed to sound cheesy. Just instructive. I love going to the G, so here's the G note. Try that, go F, F sharp G. tension and release. Create some tension and create release. Now, I'm going to go back and forth through major and minor. I'm not going to do the hybrid scale necessarily, but I'm going to go back and forth. So here's major, minor, major, minor, Now I'm going to combine them together and I'm going to go willy-nilly from one to the other without it really thinking about anything but the two scales. I'm not thinking about the major minor hybrid. I'm just playing the two scales and going to whatever note I want to go to within those scales. So sometimes I want to be happy, one moment I want to be sad. You're like, stay within this, you know, I might go up to that B there, but so I'm adding one note to this that I don't have and that's the blues. That that blues tone. So we could add we could do a hybrid between the G major and the G, G pentatonic or the G minor uh, blues. And then we'd have almost every note. It'd almost be chromatic at that point. The only note we'd be missing would be like the, the F sharp, which I just said you could go to and from. That always sounds really good. Um, that's just, I'm just going down the blue scale there. The thing I like about that is it's five notes. So you got this five note cycle that, that if you do it 16th note, it sounds random, but it's not. You see, if I did a four note 16th note pattern, it would sound like, uh, 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 like four. Oh, what am I doing? What am I doing, triplets? Like a, it sounds like a Molly Hatchet song. But if I do, uh, if I do five, I do five notes in a pattern. It's gonna sound. It's gonna cut, land on different spots of every beat, which is kind of fun. So, all right, I can stop the cheesy jazz. Stopping the cheesy jazz. You've all muted me by now, right? <laughs> okay. Um, all right, so let's... Um, 
Uh, oh, yeah, we were going to go see Dune on Friday. I saw James Bond the previous Friday, but uh, we were going to go see Dune on Friday, but it was sold out. We got to the tickets too late. I don't need to see a movie the day it comes out. I'm fine three weeks later. I'm not like I'm hanging out at a water cooler and all the People don't even really do spoilers. Like, oh, can you believe that? Although the Bond definitely has a spoiler. And I won't tell you what happens. Um... I don't know how to play Faith by Karen Aoki. Aoki. So, I don't know. Uh, but I also don't teach songs on my YouTube channel because I can't monetize it because then they would put a thousand ads on here and they take all my money. And uh, so, all right. <laughs> yeah, my ears can rest now. Uh, let's see. All right. So, uh, Freebird, you were asking about the major scale. Let's see. where can, Where is that? Uh, see, that's the G form, so we want the E form. There, it should be here. Here it is. Okay, so there's the major di diatonic for the G major scale. Uh, we can go over that. Uh, look at that R, the root thing. That's this note here. That note's also part of the scale, but we can start here because that's the root. Um, The G spot. I mean, it's it's you know it's not quite as formulaic as it was during like the '60s and '70s, but um, uh, it, it was it wasn't bad. It was okay. It was it was pretty good. I, I, you know, I I'm a huge Sean Connery fan, and I love that. I, I more more less the actual quality of the film with James Bond. It's more just like how it takes you back to a specific decade you know the 70s the roger moore ones are very 70s um and you know the ones in the 80s are very 80s i mean they're just every even the music everything about it you know is 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 good uh billy eilish i thought did a good job on the 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 uh, bond theme that's a tough call and she's a she's not even 20 so i mean she and her brother wrote it and it was great um yeah i dig a pony is that the one that's uh that's in G. Very classic country riff. Um, and it's sixths. We could do a lesson on sixths. Um, but the so here's the here's the G major scale that fits over all of this. This scale would not work over that G7 vamp though, because we have an F natural and this has an F sharp. So a better scale for that vamp we were just playing over is um, would be G mixolydian, which would be a G major scale with a flatted seventh. Okay, I'll show you that too. But here's so second finger, fourth finger, one, two, four, one, three, four, one, three, four, two, four, one, two. Okay, again backwards, two, one, four, two, four, three, one. Four three one, four two one, and then four two. Oh, I dig a pony. Sorry, you're right. That was two of us. I get those two songs mixed up. Um, and I'm a Beatles fan, and I do that. Uh, I dig a pony. Oh, oh, what I was playing sounded like that. It might have. Now that I think about it. Um, so, uh, and then, so I'll, now I'm going to give you fret numbers. Let's do the scale one more time, up and down, and I'll give you fret numbers instead of fingering numbers. Okay, so it's 3 5, 2 3 5, 2 4 5, 2 4 5, uh, 3 5, 2 3. So backwards, 3 2, 5 3, 5 4 2. Five four two again. Five three two and five three. It's hard to think about. Okay. Now the seventh. One two three four five six seven is F sharp. But if we want to create a scale that works better over a diatonic scale that works better over, say, a seventh, a dominant seventh chord, we would want to take that F sharp down to F natural. We end up with. 
and that is what's called a mixolydian scale. You don't need to worry about it. It might be something you would naturally create on your own if you were just jamming over G7 and you went, well, this scale doesn't work, but weirdly, if I move one note, it does. Um, and, and to be honest, I, you know, I always say that if a note doesn't work, if you play a note and it's not working, generally, either you go down one fret or up one fret, and that one of those two notes should work over any chord you're playing over. So if you're struggling, you're like, well, I can't find a note. This, this is weird. This note sounds weird. Well, get rid of it. Move it up a fret or down a fret, and you might find that, um, and that's, this is a perfect example of that. If you're playing over G7, and you play that major seventh, it would sound really weird. It would rub wrong, but if you just go down one fret, it works. Or you go up one fret, but that's just the G. You're going to be there anyway. So go down one fret and you create a new scale. Yes. Yeah, Prince would do that a lot. Prince definitely. Oh, Jimi Hendrix too. Um, Jimi Hendrix would go back and forth between major and minor all the time. Uh, he was definitely influenced by a lot of R&B music and a lot of um, blues players. So he... Um, um, <clears throat> He definitely would do that. Okay, so back to today's lesson. Let's, let's just review real quick. So what we did today was we learned, we took the, the E form and we put, moved it up here. Here's E, F, F sharp, G. We put it in a place where we're likely to use it. I didn't do F sharp. I didn't do A flat. I put it in G because that's a fairly common key. Uh, I guess so. I mean, we're getting rain right now, but it's a drizzle. But, uh, boy, I watched that Colts game last night, the Colts on the 49ers game last night, it was just boring. Can you imagine going to work and just having to deal with that? For, you know, most of us, even if we work outdoors on days like that, it's like, yeah, like my gardener won't show up on days it's raining. It's just like, no, they just take the day off. But <laughs> those guys, they don't have a choice. Rain is worse than snow, I think. Although I've seen a couple games that were amazing snow games too. Or the Ice Bowl. Wasn't that the Bengals? Was that the Bengals? Um, so uh, we took this thing and we, we, we learned or relearned or restated the major pentatonic. And I'm playing it. Uh, I'm not playing it uh, academically. But here's academically, which means, in other words, just staying with the fingerings. Okay, but I, a lot of times when you actually play it, you kind of tend to... You tend to use those, uh, exactly, all those mutters. You tend to use, uh, you tend to move, I tend to move my hand up like everybody does. Okay, then we learn the G minor pentatonic. And really, that's what I'll want you to learn, those two. Then what I want you to know is you can go freely over some progressions, over some G things. And even, even happy G chord progressions, um, G blues. You can use both of those scales. Um, and then over even G major, kind of like... Is it called rhythm changes, um, and um, that um, wow, dang, that's those are big waves, humble. The, um, yeah, my daughter's moving to Washington, but she's moving to the other side of the state. Uh, she's moving to, uh, uh, what did I just say? Where's she moving? Spokane. So I'm, I can't wait to visit her. It looks gorgeous. Never been up to Spokane. I've been to Seattle. I love Seattle. It's a beautiful city. Somebody's up there. Somebody on our live stream is up there. But, okay, so let's see. Uh, come on, where's she? Oh. Thanks, Holly. So, Holly, up on the Discord, if you go to the Discord and you go to, um, if you go to, uh, 
Discord and you go to Tom's um, lesson PDFs, etc. Um, Holly did a, a kind of a, a PDF of this thing here. Uh, this thing, no, dang it, over here. And um, yes, they are definitely a workout for the left hand. Um, but you don't need to, you know, like I said, it, I could, you can make a couple strings sing. Okay, kind of the point of this. What? Because if you look at, um, it's just funny. Uh, somebody makes, uh, you know, Catherine makes a statement, and it it just makes my brain think. Oh, I, you know, I should say this to add this addendums galore. <laughs> Had a band in high school called Addendums Galore. Um, no, I didn't. Uh, so, if you were to play two, just two strings of the G major pentatonic, or two strings of the G minor pentatonic, it might get a little boring. You might be like, eh. You know, I, I mean, really what I would do is I would kind of like really work on the top three strings, you know, because again, the guitar is already kind of a low instrument. So when you're soloing, you're going to really be spending most much of your time on the top three strings. So if you kind of get those down, the top three or even top two, um, you can you can say a lot musically with... down here as much. I don't really solo too much on the bottom strings unless I'm trying to create that kind of vibe. Music. Turn off the butter machine. Stan Freebird. Okay, uh, John Brandt. Isn't it interesting that you said the top three strings because I've been playing harmonica for decades, and the standard notes on a harmonica begins with the open G note and then goes up and down. Yeah, it's it's. Yeah, it, it, you know, you've already got like the bass and the drums down there. You know, you 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 want your solo to cut through, and one of the ways you can cut through is go high mass. You look at, if you were to map out the top one, you know, 100 different well-known guitar solos on the fretboard, <laughs> I could do that. I'm sure someone's done something like that, right? Where you take, uh, you know, Stairway to Heaven solo, and then you take, uh, I don't know, you take, you take the solo for um, uh, Cliffs of Dover by Eric Johnson, or... Uh, I just keep thinking of Zeppelin solos, but you know, uh, um, Heartbreaker and things like that. They're going to be on the the top four strings for the most part. If you were to do like a, a, a spectrum gram on a fretboard, you go, oh, you know, maybe every note would be played on the fretboard on a hundred different scales, um, but there would be some higher up in the middle of the neck that we played more than than on the very bottom and the very top. Um, and that's that's just because of the the voicing of where the guitar is. The guitar is a fairly low instrument. In fact, it's so low that when when um, you write music for guitar, you're actually writing up an octave from what it sounds. So when you if you if you play middle C on the guitar is actually an octave below middle C. 
So anybody who knows how to write for guitar knows that. Uh, but most people I work for, they, they, they write for guitar, but they don't realize that. So I always listen to their MIDI and go, oh, this is the pitch they want. So this is the note they want. Um, and, uh, and that's kind of what you... Uh, yeah, the levee's not dry today. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was it was a massive storm. It cut right across the state. I mean, I'm I'm not seeing it down here as much. I mean, I, when I walked to Starbucks, I didn't even open my umbrella. It wasn't it wasn't raining that hard. Um, it's supposed to start hitting around now though. Um, I don't know. It looks a little too light to be raining too hard, but we're glad to have it. I already turned off my sprinkler, so I won't be watering my lawn now for a few days, which is great. <laughs> and hopefully it'll like I said, hopefully we get enough rain to fill up my pool. I'm half tempted to get a push broom out there and take all the the water that hits the decking and push it into the pool. <laughs> Let the filter deal with it. Hey, Paul Meyer is lurking a little bit. Good to see you, Paul. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Bruce, for pointing out the the, uh, the modes. Yeah, I did the lessons on the modes. Modes. Um, uh, Humble asked about that, I guess. I missed that. Uh, yes, mixolydian scales are major scales with a flat seventh. Exactly. And um, if you want to know, a, a Lydian scale is a major scale with a raised fourth. It sounds random, but it's not. Uh, if I could do my lesson on... Um, if I could do my lesson that I want to do on the modes, which I kind of did with you guys, um, but I would do it a different way. I, I think I think my intro to modes, I think I did. I, I, I've talked about it. I know I've done videos on it, but I... I um, I'm thinking I almost am going to need to have a camera on the keyboard to do it, to do it right. And um, uh, so I don't know. I don't know exactly how that, what that's going to look like, but, um, or I'm going to have to record some piano. Um, but, which is not necessarily a problem. Um, it's just it's just going to be a very involved video, and I, I don't think I can do it in one video because it's what I do is I take the modes and I show them to you, and then I dissect them and we analyze them and dissect them, and it you know I tried to film it and I think I got into the second mode and I was already 15 minutes in, and I'm like no because that, that getting to the set the seven modes is just the first part. The way I've taught this thing in the past with students is I. I teach the, the seven modes on the piano so they can see them in, on the white keys, just using the white keys. So it's all like, wow, that, well, that's really obvious. And yet, you know, try to hear the differences. And then what we do is we analyze them and go, okay, what, what are the, the steps between the notes? So with a major scale, it's whole, whole, half, whole, whole, half, whole, whole, half, whole, 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 half. And remember we talked about tetrachords? That's what, where uh, that came from. Um, and then with the Dorian, it's whole, half, whole, 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 half, whole. Um, and so every one of the modes has its own formula. And if you line up the formulas, there's just like, it's all, it says a bunch of W's and then there's all these diagonal halves going through. So there, you can see a pattern there. And then what we do is we use the formulas to create um, what's called parallel scales. So we would create a C major scale, with a, or with a C Dorian using that, those formulas. And so we, you, when you have a parallel scale, parallel sc relative scales are scales that have the, the same notes in them. Like C major and D Dorian are relative. They have, they're both the exact same notes. They just start on a different note and end on a different note. But parallel scales are ones that start and end on the same note, but the notes change within the, the confines of the scale. So you can, you can hear it when I play C major and C Dorian. 
can definitely hear the difference. Here's C Lydian. You can hear that raised set, that raised four. Um, yeah, it's the only key. Yeah. I'm not, you know, I can, I can play in some keys. I'm not very good at piano, but, um, uh, but I use it all day long to, to enter data, you know, MIDI data for, you know, sometimes it's drum beats. <laughs> sometimes it's drum beats. And sometimes it's, if I play that on piano, that's what it would sound like. <laughs> so, um, just a tool to trade. In fact, I got to get a new keyboard. Probably get one before the end of the year. Mm, tax write-offs. Yeah, and then the 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 fourth lesson. So, it, you know, it. I, I'm probably just going to have to do my four lesson thing on the modes and break it up into four lessons. Otherwise, um, uh, <clears throat> otherwise it's going to be, um, uh, it's going to just be like a four hour video. <laughs> I mean, it just was like, it's really, really hard to do. And, and, you know, if I mess up, I have to start over again. And, you know, and I was giving myself breaks and sections so that if I messed up, I only had to go from here to here that kind of thing. Uh, but I tried to try to film it and I just, the way I taught it again, it was always with a student and someone suggested maybe teaching it, record yourself teaching it with a student and, and, and people can kind of ins mentally insert themselves in with the student. And that's, that could work. Um, that could work. Um, I could do it with Alex and just say, Hey, Alex, you want to be my student for a video? Um, but, uh, you know, it, I still feel like I 90 all 100% of my videos are me directing trying to get to you know look through the camera to the student and I would love to be able to continue to do that so it's just a matter of getting the, conceptualizing it um let's see Yes. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Yellow Jackets use Lydian, Mixolydian, and also there's uh, Mixolydian with a ray. You can combine Lydian and Mixolydian. So Lydian sounds like well, his major. Here's uh, Mixolydian. See, the thing about Mixolydian is it doesn't sound like it sounds like a major scale until you get to the seventh note, because. What? Right? And then Lydian sounds like... It's used a lot in movies. I always say it's the movie scale. Okay. You know, you might go to... sounds like a rush um but yeah the lydian thing but if you combine the if you play a, a c mix a lydian scale with a raised fourth or a c lydian scale with a flat and seventh you end up with this very exotic sounding scale it's it's basically kind of a g, uh, g in this case g mix uh, g harmonic minor or melodic minor Uh, but if you start on C, oops. it's kind of a cool jazz scale to do. So, um, my mode phase, <laughs> yeah, Ooh, pretty. What? Blimey. 
Blimey, that's a wrong note. What are you playing that note for? That's that's not uh, doe a deer. How do I play blue scale? Blue scale is um, basically going to be a C E flat. It's going to have that. It's going to be a C like a minor pentatonic with a flat five. So you have this kind of thing going. Um, I, I don't know how to finger it. I can do it better in like different keys. Oh, what key do I usually do? What key do I, what do I usually when I'm good enough? You know, e. No dumb bunny. Yeah, so um, the blues the blues scale is is just a minor pentatonic with one extra note. Okay, so if we start on the G, um, if we start on the G note here, and we go B flat, C, and then C sharp or D flat. Would I? Th I probably more likely think of it as a D flat because I'm thinking flat five, not raised four. And then you finish it off with D and F and then G, of course. So a pentatonic scale, I mean a blue scale is a six note scale. So it would be that blue scale there with an extra extra couple notes every octave, one extra note per octave. Um, yes, Tim Pierce makes good faces as he plays too. <laughs> yeah. I know Tim. Tim and I would go way back. Um, he was successful. <laughs> music business. Me not so much. Um, he's He's got quite a, a huge uh, YouTube channel too. I don't know. Is he still doing stuff? I haven't really seen. I, um, I do have a video that I'm working on right now that's just uh, a video about uh, a gig. Uh, just talking about a gig. Um, my, so I think I'm calling it my first gig was my worst gig. Or my worst gig was my first gig, I think is is uh, the name of the video. So um, so I've got one of those. I, I, if I can come up with more of those kind of story videos, I think those are people like those. So I may post that one uh, this week. Um, maybe do, I don't know. I don't know. I may do the, um, start working on that modes thing. Uh, I, I, it's just something. Also, I would love to try to set up a, a time to interview Joe de Blasi. I keep saying I'm going to do that. Um, and so I got to, cause I want Alex to help me. So I kind of have to organize it with him so that we can do at least a two camera shoot. Uh, maybe a three camera shoot. I haven't decided yet. Uh, it's up to Alex. If he really wants to edit three cameras, I don't know, three, you know, three files together. So, uh, the mnemonic, uh, blah, 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 blah. which, what mnemonic are you, uh, Oh, he, Oh, Oh, he played guitar on, wait. Oh, on her new single, because well, the pre the the other single, the single that just came out is just piano and um, uh, MIDI drums and and bass. I don't think there's any guitar on it. So, um, but he did play on uh, some Holly track. We I remember the story where he talked about like she said no wah wah. You know, because she kind of does the old school R&B thing. And it's like a wah-wah just seems natural to a guitar player, particularly an L.A. guitar player. <laughs> so, <clears throat> but that's cool that he played on that record. That's a huge record. I mean, you don't get any bigger than, than, than uh, in, in fact, Beato made this point. Because Beato just did a video on her new song and talking about how great it was. And, um, yeah, she's, her last two records went Diamond, which is 10 million copies sold. Well, now, they so they count certain number of streams as, but I think people are literally downloading or buying hard copies still, like of these records. But um, but they come up with, uh, like if a gold record, it's 500,000, platinum records a million, double platinum is 2 million, obviously. So, um 
I they there's an analytic where like 87 streams is equal to one. So if they stream a single 87 times, that's equal to one purchase or something like that. Um, and uh, I know that like when Drake released his record a few years ago, it got five billion streams each, you know, total in total individual songs, five billion um, in the first week alone. And in, uh, based on that and the numbers I know, that's just from Spotify. That's just Spotify. So um, that would be about $35 million generated um, by those spins for uh, the copyright holders, the record company, and for Drake. Um, so Adele, I have no idea how many, you know, she might have gotten a billion spins. I think they said it broke all records, the new single. But I, I didn't realize there was another single out with guitar on it. To look that up. Um, uh, but it's kind of how people do things now. They just kind of release singles and then they, you know, to, to do the record. Let's see. Discography. All right. So I guess her, she's giving away her age. <laughs> so her next record is going to be called 30. Uh, so singles. Where's the most? Here. Easy on me. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Number one, pretty much everywhere. Holy cow. Got released on the 15th. So 10 days ago. Um, oh, well, yeah, there is song, songwriter, string. Oh, are there strings on it? Vocals, songwriter. And David uh, Kirsten, or I'm sorry, uh, Greg Kirsten played. And Greg, he's in L.A. Uh, Beck, Kelly Clarkson, Halsey, 21 Pilots, Sia. He's produced a lot of a lot of people. Uh, yeah, he played piano on it, and he played uh, bass and drum machine. Uh, there's str some strings on it, I guess. I don't really, I don't remember hearing those. But yeah, that's all that's on that song. But there may be, there may be, uh, he, uh, he, because the record's done, the album is done, so I wouldn't be shocked if, uh, Tim played on the record because he played on the other records, and it looks like the first song, at least, was produced in uh, in L.A. Oh, Max Martin, Shellback, a Swedish uh, you got Ludwig Göransson, who's freaking amazing. He's a really good guitar player, and he's he did Ludwig did the score for uh, Mandalorian. He did um, Black Panther, um, and he's also a record producer. Like he produced. Um, yeah, uh, some big hits too. So he's, and he's just a young kid. All right. So what? Okay. So check this out. Um, okay. The, the Adele's new record is coming out November 19th, uh, on vinyl, which is cool. Streaming, digital download, CD and cassette. <laughs> it's coming out on cassette. Adele 30 cassette. That's hilarious. Did the single come out on cassette too? Wow, you can yeah, you can get the cassette for 30 for $17. That's amazing. Hilarious. All right. That's cool. I mean in, in kind of a weird way. Uh, let's see. Uh, sorry, I've got to catch up on it. Oh, oh, I see. Oh, t okay. T Tim dumped himself over. <laughs> That's funny. Um, let's see. Uh, so that's what he played over. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't be surprised if he's on the album at some point because, like I said, it's produced in L.A. Although, if Ludwig produced any tracks, he probably played the guitars on it if there are any guitars. Um, uh, 
Yeah, so she's, yeah. yeah. She's had some vocal struggles, you know, in her life, too. And she, I think she got a divorce. So a lot of the music that she wrote is, is the divorce stuff, which is, you know, sad. Um, yeah, tape is cool. Isn't that, that's kind of fun. Uh, it, it would be really cool if they came out with Reel to Reel. Uh, like 30 Ips Reel to Reel. No, 30 Ips would be, yeah, you could, 15 Ips is fine. 30 Ips would have to be like, you could have three songs on a roll, I think, at 30 Ips, but maybe not even that much. Um, 15 Ips, you could probably put a whole album on. Ips stands for inches per second, how fast the tape moves. And the faster the tape moves, the higher quality. We, you know, when you wanted to save money, you would go with a slower, like set it for 15 um, on the reel to reel, and like a, a, on the big reel reel machines, um, the, the the two inch tape uh, that would cost like three hundred dollars for a spool of two inch tape back in the 80s, um, that would be um, it would last about three songs if you recorded at 30 inches per second, um, but if you went to 15 inches then um, you could get like six songs on it. So all us poor rock stars, <laughs> we all used 15 ips. So, yeah, radio compresses. Well, the, the streamers compress too. So, um, yeah, yeah, they could, so your dog can chew it. That's right. So, yeah, you'll see Adele tapes in the street right along with all the masks <laughs> in the gutters. <laughs> I mean, that's that was a real thing growing up. You like cassette tapes that were just like got jammed or something, and people threw them out of their cars, and you'd be I'd be riding my bike and then going over tape, and you know, just laying out there. Yeah, Childish Gambino, that's who he worked with. That's right. I couldn't think of it. Yeah, um, yeah, Gorenson's freaking a genius. Yeah. Um, oh, uh, G major minor hybrid scale. Okay, uh, John Y has okay. Uh, John, sorry. Tom, the G major minor hybrid scale, wondering which notes of the G minor pentatonic you're adding to the G major scale to get the hybrid. It seems like the flat, but not the flat. Th what about the flat six? Um, no, those are minor pentatonics. We're, we're hybriding two pentatonic scales, not two uh, diatonic scales. So uh, let's see. Yeah, it, it, there, no, there is no flat six in a minor pentatonic. There's a flat six and a minor diatonic, but not minor pentatonic. Minor pentatonic is root, flat three, four, five, and flat seven. Uh, G major pentatonic is root, two, three, five, and six. All right? Yeah, John the uh, John Brandt, um, uh, Brandt the um, yeah the Adele song is 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 just basically a piano um, bass. It's the same guy playing all the instruments. So they did. It wasn't like musicians in a room playing together, um, which boy that just happens so infrequently now. It happens more on like you know Japanese produced records or you know German producers, French records, things like that. Um, I mean, anytime I get called to do some kind of like all in a room thing, it's usually for, uh, your, some European producer or something, and it's not for a pop record. So, um, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't even say, um, Adele was trying to create pop records, right? She's just, she's just doing her music and that's the luxury of being Adele. She, she can, you know, she's in that same place now that the Beatles were, where, they can do whatever they want, put it out, and it's going to chart because people are going to give it that second, third, and fourth listen. If Adele's Easy On Me was a, a first release by some new artist that no one had ever heard of, it probably wouldn't even track. Um, not that it's not a good song. It's just, it's it's so different than from all the kind of radio fodder out there now. Um, that radio would not give it a second listen. Um, programmers wouldn't. Um, and in the playlist, people that create the playlist, they would go, oh, yeah, what, this piano voice, that's nice, whatever, blah, blah, blah. But because it's Adele, they go, oh, wait, this is Adele. And let's listen to it a little deeply, more deeply, and let's, let's give it a second, third, fourth listen. I mean, seriously, I've always said if some random band released um, uh, Sgt. Pepper's or Sgt. Pepper's were the Beatles' first record, 
you never would have heard of them. Never would have heard of them. But they built Sgt. Pepper's uh, on their popularity doing basic pop songs. Um, Adele kind of was uh, built her popularity, I would say, not doing cheesy pop stuff, but more um, doing uh, real vocal, strong vocal, real R&B songs, crossover R&B, European. Um, she kind of might be the kind of, you could say, Amy Winehouse heir apparent, maybe, kind of, um, without the sex appeal. <laughs> I'm not saying that. What, you know what I mean? Like, in other words, Amy kind of felt like she was kind of selling a little bit with her legs, but she could sell it with her voice. She didn't need to sell it with her legs. Um, Adele doesn't need anything but her voice because she said, well, and songwriting. Good voice and bad songs, worthless. A, a good a good song and bad voice, also not going to, you know, it's it, it has to be a relatively perfect storm. So, yeah, yeah, no, Elvis, yeah, radio, radio. Yeah, and Elvis... That was probably partly bitter on his part. <laughs> he might have, because Radio Radio was before Every Day I Write a Book. So I heard Every Day I Write a Book on the radio quite a bit. Um, and that was because, see, Radio Radio turned into video video. In the 80s, songs never would have gotten played if they didn't have an amazing video. Duran Duran, I think I was I, I was listening I was listening to K-Rock, um, so I have HD radio in my car, and if I hit the forward button on K-Rock, which is the station in L.A. that launched a million artists in the 80s, um, I can hear just 80s tracks, and sometimes deep tracks, like stuff I haven't heard since the 80s. And um, But they played Girls Just Want to Have Fun, and I went, you know, this track is, it's okay. It's not great, but because... She did a video, and the video was fun, and anything that anything that MTV started to play was going to be a hit, and it was going to get on K Rock. Um, yeah, so yeah, Gary, yeah, it's a Amy Adele. It's kind of she kind of is carrying that torch, and Amy Winehouse is probably carrying someone else's torch. I think about it. I mean, I always think of what's her name from the seventies, sixties, uh, died of a, a, a alcohol poisoning. I think. Uh, but that's who I thought Amy Winehouse was trying to be, kind of a modern version of, what's her name? Everybody knows who I'm talking about, except me. Um, oh, I saw a video, Holly, it was hilarious. Somewhere on one of the blogs, I saw someone posted a video of, uh, on the anniversary of, I think it was the, would have been the 40th anniversary of MTV. Um, somebody posted their first four hours or first air eight hours brought I think if you go to YouTube um, let me see if I can find it um, it was it was pretty it was pretty bad uh, I mean just unprofessional for one thing but the music it was like I think there were three uh, it was very much the beginning um, of MTV like three rod Stewart's you know Yeah, so I'm gonna I'm entering MTV's first broadcast, first the very first two hours of MTV. Yeah, so this is yeah. Now that looks like Bowie, and Bowie's cool, but you know Bowie was someone who who had actually um, done videos. The Beatles did videos too. It wasn't like there was. In fact, there was this French machine. Uh, like a jukebox machine that the French developed that was in a lot of bars and like restaurants and stuff like that would play videos. You put money in and play videos, but it wasn't really popular here in the U.S. So people were creating, particularly European artists, were creating videos for those things. But I think this is the video I watched. It's the first two hours of it. And I mean, the song list, see if they, somebody posted it. Uh, show more. Oh, Cliff Richard was on it. Okay, so he cut out Cliff Richard. Uh, oh, so here are the songs. Uh, let's see, She Won't Dance With Me. That's the first song, I think, by Rod Stewart. Then Brass in the Pocket by Pretenders. Okay. Uh, Time Heals by Todd Rundgren. When Things Go Wrong by Robin Lane and the Chartbusters. Never heard of it. 
History never repeats by split ends. Keep on loving you by REO Speedwagon. Bluer than blue, Michael Johnson. Double life, the cars. In the air tonight. Yeah, those, I, if this is indeed the first, I, I remember some of those songs being, because I watched it, I was like, going, oh man, this is not, this is kind of brutal, but it's fascinating, you know, and, and, you know, it was a form, they had some money behind them, so they, they knew they were going to be on the air for a while. I didn't know it was going to explode like it did. But there were a lot of bands that had, um, yeah, there were a lot of bands. Well, like Video Killed the Radio Star, the Buggles. <laughs> and, and Hans Zimmer was part of that. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, music, uh, I'm not as, um, John, I'm not as uh, pessimistic about music. Of course, keep in mind, I work with young pop artists, so I, I uh, you know, I have a little bit of, nah, most of my income is not from, none of, you know, very small percentage of my income is from that stuff. But um, but I, 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 I've always looked at, and it's been the case from, from the get-go, pretty much, that the true artist in pop music, and pop music, and, you know, radio pop, is the producer. Always been the case. Elvis Presley, you know, without a producer, it wouldn't exist. Uh, the Beatles, uh, again, the producer discovered them. Um uh, you can go through music through through the decades, and really the artistry is in the the often the production, uh, the ground all the new groundbreaking stuff. You know, every decade was often produ producers. Same thing with with the grunge thing. I'm wearing my flannel. Um, the grunge thing, which was kind of an antidote uh, to um, '80s pop music, which was kind of lame. At the end of the '80s, you know, because 80s was cool because you had a lot of, um, it's just the grounds kept shifting. Uh, the 80s music w was often, it was the British, the second British invasion, and you had a lot of bands coming from England, and they did all their own playing, and they did all their own writing, okay? So it killed a big chunk of the music industry here in Los Angeles, because a big chunk of the music industry, if you look at the records in the seventies was guys doing session work for like, you know, um, uh, Barbara Streisand or the Carpenters or, you know, Mamas and Papas or any, anybody, you know, particularly in the seventies, I can try to think of some different artists, um, but also writing music for him, Paul Williams and people like that. They're all based in LA. Eighties came along, ba bands became huge on the charts. So if you look at the charts in the eighties, 50% bands. Um, you look at the charts today, you look at the top 100, I don't think you'll find a band. Maybe one band. And even then, if it's someone like One uh, Republic, technically that's just Ryan Tedder, right? It's not really a band. Um, or even uh, Maroon 5, if they've got a hit right now, a top 100 hit right now, it's technically, you know, what's his name? Adam Levine, Levine or whatever. So, um, but... Uh, but I like the energy of bands. I've always liked the band thing. I've always liked, you know, the, there's, you know, artists, it's about producing that artist and making them shine and, and kind of lifting them up and thing like that. A band was more of a, a, a unit that had to work together well. And if it didn't work together well, it wasn't going to do. And sometimes the units that worked the best together were also the ones that had the most conflict. The Beatles are a perfect example. Um, the Stones have hung out, hung around, and they've had a great run. And 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 the Zeppelin, if if you know Bonham was still alive, you know they'd still be doing stuff. Um, yeah, take on me. It, I, <laughs> but it was the video, the video production, and 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 the music production on that too. And that's where the Swedes kind of kept going. I think that was Swedish production. Uh, I, you know. I forget what percentage of the GDP of Sweden is pop music, but I know when I get royalties for Bieber tracks, um, I get the checks from Sweden are higher than Sweden, Israel, and Ireland are, pay m much higher royalties than any other countries. Um, some countries don't pay any, like Ecuador don't pay; they won't pay anything. So I've got a good friend who's big in Ecuador, but they can't make a lot of money there. So. Yeah, yeah, 80s definitely affected the 70s music. Um, there was some great rock music in the 70s, mostly in the early. And then you had, the, the like, the Eagles, who they continued to make great music into the 80s. I, 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 don't, I don't necessarily agree, though, that you had to be good-looking to make a video. I, I think of the Cars, uh, Rick Ocasek was not a good-looking guy. I mean, 
So ladies, you can help me out here, but name the the artist. I mean, there were some guys uh, who did. Who was the lead singer for the Babies? I mean, he was good looking, but he also could sing. Um, but there's definitely some, um, and then it, maybe that was case for girls. Although I don't know that Cindy Lauper is particularly good looking. She's just kind of fun, right? Um, hey, get to fifty likes. Why not? Right? I'd like that. Yeah, and and of course I read a book called Hit the Hitmen. Uh, let me see if I can find it. It's it's uh, I'll, I'll pull it up on uh, uh, I'll pull it up on Amazon um, because if I'll give you a link that way if um, yeah, here it is. Um, so anything, anything you buy, any Amazon links that I give you, if you buy, I get a little percentage of it. But this book was was pretty. It's fascinating. Now keep in mind, it's dated now, but I think it took us up through the nineties. What year was it published? Hold on, I'll give you the link. So check out this. You can read the synopsis if you want. Uh, someone said if you read it, you'll want to quit the music business. I, I didn't come come away with that, but uh, Originally published in 91. So it, it has definitely 80 stuff. There's some amazing stories in there. And uh, the, the book called The Hitmen. And, um, it, you know, there was a huge payola scandal. Payola, the term, if you know the word payola, it's because there was a huge scandal. And a lot of people got arrested. And there was a lot. And this book talks about that. And it was very much tied to the mob. So a lot of the classic music that we know from the 50s, 60s, and even 70s, was only we only know it because somebody paid somebody with drugs or sex or money to get it played on the radio. It became the norm, and the I, 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 the feds had to get involved, and um, so so there, there's that. And then um, so even even the music that we think oh man before videos and before pop and the auto tune and all this stuff you know music was so great. It's like yeah, but most of that music probably came about because somebody was paid off to not play a better band <laughs> or a better artist, but to play this artist, right? Um, and yet, then there are artists that are just so good they can't be denied. I think the police are that I, I, a good example of that. And the Beatles are too. Uh, but again, the Beatles started out as a pop band. The police started out as what they were. Uh, they were doing their own little punk reggae um, uh, hybrid. And um, so... Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm sure I'm getting a lot of opinions here. Yeah, disc jockeys really don't play me, pick music anymore. Programmers do, and stations, radio stations are often owned by big corporations, and they have programmers that play everything. So, um, and they're the ones, occasionally, they, you hear about it, occasionally get a story where a programmer's been arrested or, you know, charged with some kind of payola scandal. So, yeah, the police were totally original. I, and, and again, so good that they couldn't, and but the police were an example of, of K-Rock launching a band because K-Rock started playing them. Um, if K-Rock started playing them, it got around the country and college radio stations too. So K-Rock in the 80s, and I think still today, don't have programmers. It's an independent station. Um, and um, K-R-O-Q is the, is the call. And you can, you can put it on if you want. Now, K-Rock now today is mostly like pretty much hard rock, uh, alternative stuff. And they... They'll still play Nirvana, you know, they'll still play Teen Spirit every day and you know, multiple times. And you kind of like, you know, rock of the, you know, rock t today's rock or whatever. It's like, no, it's not. <laughs> you know, they'll, they'll do a little bumper that'll say like music of today and then they'll play Nirvana. And I'm like, yeah, I, you know, I wish Nirvana was still around. But they'll play Foo Fighters, they'll play Green Day, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, but it was alternative station is what it was. And Nobody was really playing anything like it when they when they came around, except some college stations. So I, you know, if you have uh, iHeartRadio, you can you can store a bunch of college radio stations, things like that. You know, I think if I had a radio station, it would be the most eclectic thing. You'd have classical music one, and then bebop, and then you'd have a pop tune, and then you'd have a classic rock tune. I mean, you it would be all over the map. People wouldn't listen to it. <laughs> that's that's why radio stations tend to play the same music over and over again because they they really do. They're they are designed to meet a certain audience. And if I had um, now, there's a station in L.A. 
Um, if you don't know about it, it's 885. It's uh, CSUN Radio, uh, the college right down the street from me. And um, uh, uh, California University Northridge, California State University Northridge, CSUN. And um, they have a radio station. They hired a bunch of the old K-Rock DJs. And they can play whatever they want. And like on Sunday mornings, they do like two hours of nothing but Bob Dylan. Before that, it's like two hours of Americana. Um, and then, you know, things you would never hear on other radio stations because it's technically donation driven. So, yeah, you, you can. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, I, 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 uh, Joseph, I wouldn't be surprised if the Beatles and the Stones kind of worked together to make sure they weren't releasing at the same time. Because uh, they definitely didn't want to compete with each other. The, the Beatles would do singles and then records, and the singles wouldn't be on the records, which is not how they do it today. And then they would do records like I think, I think yesterday the album that we know in America as Yesterday and Today is just a bunch of songs that were I guess singles maybe or or that's I don't know. There's a couple records like that that are just like in America they put them out as albums. Um, Go for it, Jack. Go, go go get your appointment. Space Oddity's great. Isn't that a great? Yeah. And well, John, you and I are the same age then. Um, Al Martino. Oh my gosh, I haven't heard that name in forever. Oh, good. P Peter Anderson's been practicing hard. Going to hear it? Uh-oh, we're almost to 50. Well, I'll get to 50 after I shut down, but maybe. Uh, okay, wait. Uh, the Steve Barry, sorry, I, got, I just saw this. There was an interesting process of 70s band members becoming huge solo pop artists. Yeah, that, yeah, Peter Cetera, Phil Collins, Michael McDonald. Yep, yep, I would agree with that. I'm not a, I wasn't, I, I wasn't a huge Genesis fan. I just didn't get it. Um, I love Peter Gabriel, and he didn't go on to become a pop star technically. If, uh, uh, Sledgehammer kind of makes fun of it, you know. He ended up becoming a pop star only because he's so artistic and Video became the medium, and his art carried from his music to his, his videos, and his, his videos were just super popular because they were so fun to watch. Um, I think Sledgehammer would have been a big song anyway, even without a video. Well, no, everybody had to have a video. That was, that was a, a given in the 80s. No, once you got to 83, 84, you know, so many bands we never would have heard of, like perfect example is uh, uh, Duran Duran, had it not been for MTV in the in the eighties, uh, and uh, I'm sorry, MTV and the uh, videos, and um, and again K Rock, which you, you think, well, I didn't live in California, yeah, but K Rock like created playlists that other people would um, college stations would copy, or they would get their a lot of times they would get their new music from K Rock somehow. Um, Yep. So, John, you know, I was born in 1961 in Indiana. So, but I've been here since '83. So, I feel like I was born here. Um. Oh, there's also yeah, uh, uh, Radio Garden. That may be something, Steve. There's an app that I have on my phone called Radio, and it's super cool. I, I can't play it for you, but. Um, let's see. I make sure I'm muted. Um, but that's it right there. So you can get that app, and it's really cool. You, um, I, I have a login. You click on any country, like Brazil in 1970, and it'll play music from the radio in Brazil in 1970. Or I, I can go to Portugal, or I've been going to like Morocco. Yeah, Morocco 80s, you know, listening to 80s Moroccan music because <laughs> I want to get some oodlicks in my ears. Uh, but yeah, you, you know, you go to Spain, you can go to England, England 80s, and it'll play, you know, here's Heaven, Heaven 17 is now playing. So it's really, really cool app and it's free. Um, and I think you can even donate. Kiss FM was, yeah, it, it still exists. Kiss FM um, was a, the big pop station in L.A., um, now there's K, uh, there's Amp 107, one, Amp 97, Kiss is 102.7. Yeah, I'll still listen to Kiss, you know. Um, I, I try to, I mean, I listen to pop music, but I'm not a pop producer, even though I've got pop production credits. Uh, when you create, a lot of times, when I create guitar, um, when I create guitar parts, 
like when I um, if I if I write a guitar thing that starts a song, like in other words, if I write a guitar and a uh, hook and send it to somebody and then they build a song on it and it might it's all started with my guitar they'll put me down as one of the producers uh, so i get a piece of the production pie and that kind of stuff so kmet i miss kmet that was a great station there was another station that didn't last as long that played uh, that became a mexican station which was of course what so many la stations did um kmet may have been one of those what was their call lot? was it what was their numbers John, do you remember what KMET was? Um, uh, oh, oh, 94.7. Okay, well, 94.7 is the wave. Oh, my gosh. 94.7 became smooth jazz. See, that was a big loss. Yeah. And it was... It was it was quirky, yeah, you're right, but it it, it was fun. Uh, Richard Beebe, uh, let's see, who is Dr. Demento? Yeah, that's where Dr. Demento, Cynthia Fox, I remember her. Um, Jim Ladd, yeah, a lot of the DJs, I remember their names. Uh, it went down pretty much after I moved to L.A., though. It wasn't here very long. When did it, when did it end? 87, fired. They fired the entire honor staff at February 9th, 1987. Oh, my gosh. Golden Slumbers medal. Yeah, they played that at the end. That was the last thing they played. Yeah, and it's been smooth jazz format ever since, which is not good. But, you know, it's it, there's enough dentist offices in California to keep them rolling. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this is pretty inside baseball for LA people, but uh, but you, every city's had these ch stations that went. Oh, why did they close this tape? My favorite. But this one, I can't remember what it was called. John, maybe you can help me. But they would play like um, John Hyatt, um, which I was you know in the night early nineties. So like um, uh, shoot, uh, it was like alt country. They played like alt country stuff. Uh, Bonnie Raitt. Um, and it was a really good station, KRLA, KRLA's TV, I think. Yeah, yeah, KMET went to Soft Jazz, yep, uh, let's see. Oh, we listened to CHOM, out of Montreal, great rock station, okay. Well, and that's the other one they have, uh, in Mexico, they have, is that still around, John? Is that, is that, because I know when I would go to Orange County, I could get it, uh, the, um, Pirate radio uh, from Mexico, and it was like 500,000 watt. Like the limit in America, I think it's 50,000 watt. Maybe they've changed that. Um, but this, <laughs> this station was like 500,000 watts. And it was just over the border. It was an American-owned station, and they, they just skirted the law. Oh, you live in Lomita. Okay, so yeah, you know some of these stations, definitely. Yeah, K-Rock, KMET. Um, uh, well, uh, KLOS still exists. KLOS is just basically classic rock, you know. And that's one of those things that's funny because classic rock used to be Beatles' first three records, first four records, you know, Love Me Do, um, Long Tall Sally, things like that, and they don't play that stuff anymore, right? Uh, it, it's, it's, it's really tough for a, a rock band to get something that's going to be played through the ages. Uh, today, that's almost... Virtually impossible, but like uh, KLOS will play play Green Day. They'll play, you know, they'll play one like Bush song or live the band live, or they'll this the, the one song that made them famous probably is the one they'll play, um, and then they'll still play lots of Zeppelin, Tom Petty, uh, still play late Beatles, Stones, uh, the classics, all that kind of stuff. KLOS will do that, yeah. Uh, Carmel by the C O K L R B. No, you know. Oh, one more like. <laughs> well, let me see. Do I have 50 yet? 48. Well, so I haven't seen that 49th like yet. Joe, thanks for the coinage. I appreciate it. Um, okay, you grew up in Redondo. My son lives in Redondo now. Or uh, not Alex. Jack lives in Redondo. He works at he works at Northrop Grumman. 
which I need to buy stock in Northrop. I missed that boat. I should have bought it the day he started working for him. It's gone up like $100 since my my son's making. He must be doing something right because their, their stock's gone up $100 since he started working there. It's been a year now. He's been there a year. He started in September last year. That's crazy. Queen. That's right. Queen has still played. In fact, yeah, Queen has played the most. You're right. Bohemian Rhapsody is probably the, you know, t long since taken over for... It's still close. Hotel California would be, it's neck and neck, but Stairway to Heaven is long gone. Like, they don't play, I hardly ever hear Stairway to Heaven on the radio anymore. But back in the day, that was, oh, Coast, I remember Coast. Coast is still there. Coast is still there. I, I just don't listen to it. I, I, it's kind of in that, like, it's like mom rock. <laughs> you know, yacht rock. It's like, Coast is like mom rock or something. Take care, Catherine. God bless you. Yes. So the grunge thing, uh, Pumpkins, Nirvana, yes, yeah, Smashing Pumpkins, great, uh, 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 Pearl Jam. Uh, I, I watched that video. I need to do a video. I, you know, I should do one of those, my, my top 10 most influential records. Um, and it won't be what you think. Um, it, re they won't, it won't be what you think. Um, but uh, I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a video of my top 10 most influential records and um uh for me that that kind of charted my path and i i'm visual i'm just thinking of them right now and it's literally one record steered me one direction for a while and then another record hit and it steered me this way boom like that you know and so it, it kind of navigated me through my uh my studies and through my career in a lot of ways uh, so I'm going to, that's a, uh, I'm going to do that. What's the horrible oldie station? Well, John, there's, there's a, the oldie station now is AM, which is funny because I have it on my dial in my car because every now and then you, I mean, AM just drives me crazy because it's always staticky. I don't know. They, they can't get it down. There's, there's the new high def AM, which my car can't get. So I think on a, a newer cars can't get it. A lot of times if I want to listen to some on AM, I'll try to find it on iHeartRadio, like sports talk or something like that. But um, but there is a, uh, it's kind of fun because it sounds like an AM radio. It, it literally sounds like the 60s. And they're playing Elvis. See, nobody plays Elvis anymore except those kind of things. And there's no oldies FM in L.A. that I know of. So, um, uh, but like I said, if you're in L.A., check out um, CSUN Radio, which is 88.5. It's just very, very, very eclectic, which I love. Um, I love the part of the reason I will listen to radio. Part of the reason I listen to pop radio, okay. Here, one of the reasons I listen to to Kiss FM and Amp one uh, uh, ninety seven one I think um, is because I'm going to hear something I've never heard before. The new I don't know. Uh, you know who's really good right now uh, is uh, 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 Rodriguez. What's her name? Um, Shoot, what's that? Is it Rodriguez? Uh, if I if I go to um, uh, let's see, if I go to Billboard Top Hundred. I wonder if Adele's already on top of it here. You know, Ed Sheeran's not bad. Um, he's one of those people that I feel like he was, he couldn't be denied. I mean, he was, he was a busker. You know, he would get out there and literally in the, you know, train stations in London. Uh, okay. Oh, Lil, Lil Nas. Yeah. <laughs> it's just awful stuff. Uh, now that Kid Leroy and Bieber track, The Stay, is uh, got a great melodic hook. And I think that was written by Shawn Mendes, maybe, that the hook on that thing is really good. Uh, oh, Olivia Rodrigo, that's who it is. Check out, you know, it, it, she does, she's bringing back um, kind of power pop. Um, there, there are bands that came so close. I, I really feel like, oh man, like who was it? Oh, The Knack. The Knack was a great power pop band. And it, they, they hit right around the same time as the British Invasion and, you know, My Sharona. And 
it's just a I, I you know really wanted that genre to kind of develop, but then the then the um, uh, the British invasion bands kind of went synth kind of synthy, right? They're more synth and guitar driven, um, and so power pop. What it is is pop songs with guitars, like driving guitars. Um, what's the girl that was the the skater skater girl? You know, from twenty years ago. She was she was kind of in that mode. Um, and I feel like, um, uh, uh, what's her name? Olivia Rodrigo is kind of in that. Check her out. I mean, I know it's pop. I know it, but she's, there's something there that's like, yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah, let's rock. Let's have some fun, you know? Let's not, and there's probably auto-tuning going on, but it, she's, so it's, it's uh, Olivia Rodrigo. Really, really uh, Rodrigo, I'm not spelling this right, probably. Rodrigo, I don't know. You get the idea. You get the gist. Um, uh, but Rodrigo and Gra Gabriela, oh my gosh. <laughs> um, yeah, American, yeah. Americana music is, is really big right now. And, um, uh, it's it's kind of cool. I, I, I'll be honest. I think part of it is because of all the people from L California that are moving um, to uh, n to Austin to Nashville uh, to moving to those regions, and they're bringing a lot of money. Um, Coast is one hundred three point five. Yeah, that's right. Um, earworm. <laughs> so. Yeah, so I I try to keep up on the pop stuff a little bit. Um, uh, I one of the things that I really liked about teaching guitar lessons, because I, I had I would have, you know, ninety percent of my students would be junior high and high school boys, and they would bring me. I mean, there were so many bands that I'd never heard of, like Muse. I remember one of my students brought me Muse, and I'd never heard them before, and I went, "Wow, this is a good band." Uh, Muse gets played on classic rock stations, um, and they're still creating really good music. Um, and and they'll go kind of vacillate between synthy and rock. You know, like they'll do a record that's very synthy, maybe overproduced, and then they'll do a record that's very guitar driven and very you know raw. I feel uh, uh, Foo Fighters. You know, uh, Dave Grohl's very much uh, kind of a, a torchbearer for the for for rock music as it should be recorded. Um, you know, I wish you would hear more of it. Dri oh, yeah, yeah. Driver's License is a great song, and that was her, her um, kind of introduction, but her new record is very much, uh, much more, like, Driver's License is kind of more of a pop-type song. Um, uh, I'm trying to think. There's guitars on that, but um, but her new record is this more driving. It's fun. It's, it was produced by one guy. It was just like, it's just like the two of them doing this record. And um, uh, so it, it definitely, um, this guy is going to be a very successful producer. Um, let's see. I'll find, I'll find who the producer is. <clears throat> I mean, I'd love to work with some of these people, but I mean, I do work with some of these people. I mean, a lot of them know who I am, which is cool, you know. I always say it's not who you know, it's who knows you. Early life. Hilarious. She's born in 2003. And <laughs> Wikipedia has early life heading. I'm like, early life heading? What are you kidding? Uh, she's Filipino-American. Which is big because there's a lot of Filipinos and Americans in L.A. Yeah, she had a, She was doing stuff in, when she was 12. So she's been around for a while. Um, yeah, Driver's License hit number one on literally every chart. Unbelievable. And I guess Driver's License is technically on this album. So uh, so the album's called Sour. Number one across the board, every pretty much every country. And uh, producer... Yeah, Daniel Negro, it's Negro, I guess is how you say his name, N-I-G-R-O. Uh, former lead singer, guitar player uh, in the rock band As Tall as Lions. That happens so often that somebody, but he produced and co-wrote every single song. So, um, 
Yeah. Pretty crazy. Smashes, smashes, just one hit after another for this record. I mean, I, I remember when, uh, yeah, she's got two number ones off this record, and Deja Vu hit number three. Trader and Brutal, Brutal are uh, nine and 12. That's pretty high up. But uh, I remember when um, uh, Katy Perry was just, she had six number ones on Teenage Dream. <laughs> and she's like, are you kidding me? So, yes. Yeah, you, if you have a, t a teenage daughter, yeah, my, da my daughter is 24 and lives, well, is going to be moving to Spokane. So she's not anywhere near. Um, and, but she's got much more eclectic. She doesn't listen to pop music. She listens to, she she listens to jazz, old jazz. Um, she loves the Beatles, James Taylor, um, and then she'll listen to like Americana stuff, vocal things. I don't really know her much for listening to pop stuff. She's never been too much into that. Chili Peppers, great band, and they do get played on the classic rock stations. Um, and uh, they're still creating music, right? I think they've kind of gone through many iterations, but. Um, yeah, and Steve, driver's license the melody on that, it's a great melody. In fact, uh, Rick Beato liked that song, you know, uh, and and really, that's the hook. Um, we can play the game. Where's the hook? Um, uh, and um, they, um, uh, you, you know, you play, you play. Uh, um, it's not the hook isn't always the chorus melody. It's a, in pop music. It's a good and and do all songs have hooks? Yeah, maybe uh, you could say that. Any song that catches your ear or that you remember, but a hook could be like you think about the the riff at the beginning of "Beat It" by Michael Jackson. That's the hook. As soon as that happens, you're you're already you're there. You're there. You're brought into it. Beat it, beat it, beat it, beat it. That's not a hook. That's just an excuse to get to the hook, right? Um, same thing with Day Tripper. Day Tripper, the so that's good. Now, I've said this before here. I know. For me, it's like the hook can be a lot of things. And for me, um, I remember hearing a song on K Rock, and I'm driving in my car, and I. They, you know, always bugs me when they don't tell you who the artist is because they assume you know or something. I don't know. But they'll play like five songs in a row or ten songs and then they tell the artist maybe afterwards. Oh, Blues Travel, I forgot about the hook. Yep. Um, uh, and um, uh, I heard the song and I, I, all I, I couldn't remember anything from the song, but I went to Tower Records and I said, hey, you know, it was a song that went like right before the chorus. It went, chug chug. The guitar was like, kugunk, kugunk. And he goes, oh, that's Creep by Radiohead. And I went, oh. And to me, that's the, the hook, really, is that that's like the thing that brings you in. Uh, Where Are You Now by by uh, Justin Bieber. I feel like it's like, where are you now that I need you? That thing leading into the, you know, that's the hook. Just the, the percussive element. I think that's uh, um, uh, Skrillex. Uh, Sonny did that, Skrillex. And... Um, in fact, I just was told that I've got a song coming out with Skrillex, which is cool. Um, I think the, the, his people called me and asked me, you know, for my information and stuff like that. So I gave it to him. Uh, they said I wrote a song with him. So, uh, so I, I, I I'm not going to say who the artist is yet, um, but uh, it, I'll make an announcement when it comes out. So. Oh, hey, Bulldog. Yeah. Dum, bum, 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 bum. So one of my favorite Beatles riffs. It's just a great, fun, it's a fun riff to play. Um, well, and so, so those are hooks. That's a hook to me. Uh, uh, Money by, you know, uh, uh, I, now here, Money by Pink Floyd. What's the hook? Is it the boom, ba, doo, doo, boom, 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 right? That's definitely a hook. But the hook could be just the fact that they started the song with money sounds, right? The cash register sounds and the chains and all that. That's the hook. because it's The hook is the thing that pulls you in. The hook is the thing, I always say this, the hook is the thing that gets the 13-year-old girl to call the radio station and say, hey, play that song again. <laughs> you know, I, I know that sounds weird, but it's like, what's the thing? And, it, and I don't think Pink Floyd was big with 13-year-old girls, maybe when, maybe when they first came out. But it's like, what's the thing to get 
and and that's like in the rock realm. In in the pop realm, it's more thirteen year old girls. But in the rock realm, it's like what's going to get that fifteen year old boy to call the station and say, "Hey, man, play that song that has the the, the cash register at the beginning." That's that's whatever it is that you use to describe the song when you can't describe the song. That's the hook. You know, if it's the melody, um, uh, money, yeah. But there was song, you know, there were songs called Money before that. The Beatles had a song called Money. The Stones did it too. I think they did the same song. I think Beatles wrote that song for the Stones. Uh, that was it called Money, was it? it? Has money in the title. And then also there were Money, 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 Money. But that may have been after Pink Floyd. Money, 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 Money. So, um, I've never heard Spooky Toots cover of I Am the Walrus. Um, but yeah, I mean, you could t t t just any, any song. Um, I, sometimes I think, I really feel like if, um, I, I, so often I feel, I mean, because I'm a guitar player, I feel like the, the, the guitar part is the hook. But I, will, I always feel like w when I'm writing, a lot of times when I'm writing guitar hooks, um, like when I did Home to Mama. Whatever, when I did that. I was um, uh, I was trying to come up with something that was hooky but also easily playable because um, I always felt like if a song was fairly easy to play, then a lot of people would buy the song because they wanted to learn how to play it. You know, like oh, I can play that on guitar. That's not too hard. Uh, and of course, I've I've seen like a million tutorials on how to play that song, and they're all wrong, and they've got like two hundred thousand views. And I I teach it, and I've got like two thousand views. <laughs> This is funny, Salvador. What's going on? I'm going. I'm late today because I started late today. So I, we've probably gotten a lot of different people jumping on. We got 1,300 playbacks, uh, 36 concurrent viewers. We've gotten up as high as 40, hit 40 twice now. I think. Yeah, that's pretty good. Currently, I'm 40, 36. Everybody's kind of digging this discussion. Um, I want to. I want to be your man. For this, so that's right. They both recorded. That's right, Steve. I want to be your man. Wanna be all man? Dun, 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 dun. Now, see, there's a hook. I, I, I wanna be all man. Dun. I wanna be all man. Dun, 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 dun. That thing is a hook. And did George Martin do that? Is that a George Martin? Because that's on the. That's on the. the uh, it's not a Rhodes. It's uh, probably a Wurlitzer. Uh, yeah, it's a Wurlitzer. Um, what is that? Um, kind of a classic Wurlitzer. Let's see, where is that? I have electric piano, classic Wurlitzer. You know, Wurlitzer is cool because it, if you hit it hard, it distorts. Yeah, if you hit it kind of hard, Wurlitzer's kind of distort a little bit, which makes them really fun. Um, let's see. I'll listen to what the flower children say. Is that, is that the... Uh, uh, shoot, listen to what the flower children... Is that Spinal Tap or is that uh, Mighty Wind? I saw Spinal Tap live, and uh, Mighty Wind warmed them up in character, and the movie hadn't been released yet, so people, a lot of people figured it out pretty quick. I figured it out pretty quick that it was the same guys, uh, but they were in costume and in makeup and all that stuff. It was pretty amazing. What was the name of the the for, the, the Folksman? <laughs> the Folksman. If you haven't seen a Mighty Wind, it's it's honestly a very loving tribute to the folk music era and how it became cheesy. You know, the new minstrel, the new Christy minstrels, you kind of make fun of that. And then they kind of make fun of Peter, Paul and Mary. And, oh, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's something else. 
give me some money, Spinal Tap. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> now, Spinal Tap's awesome. It's, it's awesome. I know, uh, let's see, I know uh, Harry Shearer. I've actually played guitar for his Christmas party. Um, he does this, he was doing this annual thing until COVID hit, uh, where they were doing this fundraiser. Um, and, uh, they would have a bunch of people get up and sing songs. So like all these people, in fact, uh, Fred, uh, what's his name? I got to talk. I spent a good long time talking to Fred. Uh, what's his name? Who just passed away. What a sweetheart of a guy. Nicest guy. And I also got to talk to Peter Asher, who I really wanted to, you know, like it was cool. I got to play Peter Asher's big hit with Peter Asher, which was fun. Um, and uh, he he uh, was Paul McCartney's roommate for like three years, <laughs> yeah, because Paul lived with the Ash Asher family during Beatlemania, and uh, in London. So we I talked to him about that, and I the stuff I learned about it I regurgitated to him, and he said, "Yep, that's all true. That's exactly what happened." I said, "Do you still have that house?" He goes, "No, I wish." But uh, yeah, they, I, I wonder where that was. I it wasn't Holland Park. Um, Holland Park is a gorgeous area that we, of, of the uh, in London. That's the um, I kind of like the um, uh, Mary Poppins houses. It's kind of like a row rows of those. And uh, Beth and I walked through Holland Park, not realizing we were walking right by the Beckham's house. <laughs> but I didn't know the Beckham's back then. Um, the new originals. Oh my gosh, so good. Yeah, yeah. The new originals. It's such a Jane's birth. Um, but yeah, uh, Harry Shearer. So yeah, I, I the uh, C.J. Vanston, who's a phenomenal musician, one of the best musicians I know. He is uh, Spinal Tap's music director. So and not that they've done anything recently, but Harry Shearer's done stuff. So he's done stuff with Harry, and then he 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 will score all of Christopher Guest's movies. So I don't I haven't been on one though because I, I, I he hasn't done one since C.J. and I became good friends. But I need to hit up C.J. and say how he, see how he's doing. Um, okay, enough about me. What do you think about me? <laughs> so, I can't believe you guys are still hanging around. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so, you know, I, I, I actually um, have a, a playlist on YouTube that's private, but it's, I call it Where's the Hook? And I, I wanted to use it with, um, if I ever taught a class on pop music, not that I, I mean, I, I don't know that I would consider myself an expert, um, but uh, there's professors that have studied pop music through the years. But one of the things I do tell people when they come to me and say, I want to write a song for Bieber and stuff. And I'm like, and they, or they send me something and they go, Hey, can you get this to Justin? And I'm like, I listen to it. And it's like, no, it's awful. And not that it's awful. It may be a really good song or it might be good production or something, but it sounds like something he would have done four albums ago. And what you need to do, if you're going to be pitching to a, uh, to an artist, and really you're probably more likely going to be pitching to a producer of the artist. And then if they like the song, they may, track it with the artist or something. It's just generally pitch, pitches, song pitches are just not how things get done. It's mostly teams. Like if you really want to be a pop songwriter, what you want to do is probably try to get a manager in Los Angeles. And then the man, if you're, if you're good at something, um, you have to be good at something first, like creating top lines, which is melody or writing lyrics or creating beds, which is what I do. And then you get a manager and the manager will put you in rooms with other people. And that's why you'll see 17 names on a pop song because it's just a, it's a bunch of people working together. There may be people working together just to create a beat in one room and then they bring the beat in and then they write a song over it. And that's another group of people and somebody plays bass on it and they get percentages and somebody plays guitar or somebody plays a keyboard lick or whatever. And so everybody's getting percentages of the song. That's generally how a lot of those songs come about. Not all of them, but a lot of them come about that way. And, or, or, you know, teams like there may be a team like I know Andrew Watt, who's a friend of mine and he's, got producer of the year last year he's got a group of people that he works with you know i would love to be part of that but he's a great guitar player so he doesn't need me and so andrew will you know has a group that he works with and i you know i you know at 60 i still feel like that kid in high school it's like outside the you know look like a group of kids in the in the civic in the center of the school you know in, in the courtyard or whatever at the school and they're, they're like and i'm kind of standing on the outside trying to weasel in i'm trying to put my shoulder no and like now, you really can't do that. It just has to be organic and, and naturally conglomerated. And um, uh, so if you – but a lot of times – like if, you're, if you want to try to pitch a song to some artist, what you want to do is you want to look at their 
trajectory, their their artistry. Their, so this is their first record, second record, third record, now the current record. Well, what's the fifth record going to sound like? You got you've got to try to predict that. He's not going to want nobody. No artist is going to want to do something that sounds like their first record. So like if I'm going to pitch a song to uh, Camilla, uh, Cabela, um, I'm not going to do a I'm not going to do a, a like a, a remake of uh, Havana. I'm not going to do a Spanish thing. I probably avoid anything that's got like a any kind of um, minor with a major four five chord. Um, I'm going to avoid that because it's like she's probably not doing that anymore. Um, so what I might do is some kind of rock thing because maybe nobody else will pitch that. Just something that can get the artist to go, wow, okay, that's different. Oh, I'd love to sing over that. So, you know, having a good t sound on the file doesn't hurt. So, uh, name my favorite forgotten classic rock artists. Ooh, forgotten. Yeah, it, it is interesting, John, because they do, uh, again, the classic rock stations are very, very slow to add songs on the on the front end on the new songs right like a big classic you know something has to be like 20 years old so there's a, there are green day songs now getting played in the classic but to do that and i said this with amazon when amazon came by for amazon to succeed a brick and mortar is going to have to fail well for for green day to, to get onto the classic rock stations they're going to have to take something off and that's where i think the early beatles the early stones Elvis, forget. They're, they're never playing Elvis again. I don't even remember hearing Elvis on classic rock stations, to be honest. But you would hear Beatles. You would hear, you know, oldies stuff. Oldies, you know, it's like, and so the timeline kind of will, it will stretch and become more time inclusive. But then there are going to be artists in the middle that are going to get pulled off. Um, and that's the ones where it's like the forgotten ones. Like one hit wonders or maybe catalogs that don't get played as much as they used to. Um, well, Beatles is, like I said, Beatles is a good example. They, there were probably 47 songs at one point that they that were on a playlist for classic rock. Now it's probably down to 37, okay? Same with the Stones. There were probably 47 songs that they would play. If this, if this were 1985, there were probably 47 Stone songs that they would play. They probably whittled that down to 37. I'm, these numbers are probably on a high side. Um uh, Santana might be one, John, that is not getting as much play. I mean, I will still hear Black Magic Woman. Uh, Oyo Como Va, probably not so much. Uh, but I would say Santana's kind of coming off of that list for some reason. Um, let's see, who else would be classic rock? Uh, um, Jefferson Airplane probably is falling off of that. I wouldn't say that one. Of, I've never been a Jefferson Airplane fan. Um, uh, and what's her name? What's the woman that died in the seventies from San Francisco? Um, I, I couldn't think of her name earlier. Uh, Janet, uh, uh Janis Joplin. I, I don't hear her on, on, on classic rock stations anymore. Um, Dylan sometimes, you know, but it's hard when you, you think about it, you play a Dylan song next to a Zeppelin <laughs> song next to like system of a down or, <laughs> Maybe not System of Down. Who am I thinking of? Uh, you know, you could say Green Day or or Chili Peppers. The Dylan song is going to feel like it doesn't fit. Chili Peppers and Stones, totally fine. Chili Peppers and Zeppelin together, no problem. Chili Peppers and Jimi Hendrix, perfect. Oh, my gosh. They belong right next to each other on the radio. But it, it, you hear, like, Zeppelin, Chili Peppers, and they put a Dylan song on, people are going to change the station. And, that, and that's kind of what they're, how they gauge their playlist. But Hendrix is definitely, his playlist, you know, it was eight songs. Now it's down to four songs, right? Foxy Lady, Purple Haze, you know, maybe Hey Joe. Um, uh, so, you know, those some of those things. Um, Rare Earth, Canned Heat, yes. Mountain, yeah. Though I saw him. I, I saw, who did I see? Proko Harum I saw when I was a kid. Um, and they'll, they'll only play the, what is it? Whiter Shade of Pale or something like that? Pale Shade of, pale shade of White? <laughs> uh, that's the only team they've ever played at Proko Harum. Grand Funk Railroad was a great song. That's right. That's one that's going to get, you know. And again, it's just one of those things where if they're not getting the requests for it, the problem is Grand Funk Railroad probably didn't have five big
big smashes. If they had, you know, or they weren't a big touring band. Queen, big touring band, man. Those shows, you know, when they would tour, it was a huge event. You know, uh, the Beatles, really non-touring um, after a point. Um, Zeppelin, the Stones, the Stones are touring today, you know. I have a bunch of friends that went to see them, and I couldn't believe the videos I saw of Keith, uh, I mean, uh, well, Keith <laughs> standing and Mick dancing. It's like, what is going on out there? Um, yes, all musicians have their own fingerprint. It's true. But some fingerprints connect with other people, and some most fingerprints don't. Yeah, Elvis is, it's just hard. Who's going to play Elvis on the radio, you know? Um, I still hear him on commercials, you know, and he's referenced. And of course, if you do a movie that's a timepiece, you know, you got if you're going to do a movie from the '50s, if you can get an Elvis song, and sometimes that may be some of these problems, not the radio problem because they don't have to pay for this. But sometimes, if like Hendrix family, you can't use one of his songs unless you pay a million and a half or something like that. It's very, very expensive to get one of his songs on um, uh, in a movie. Um, uh, the Beatles wouldn't do it. They would never. It's called licensing. And I've, I've licensed a few songs here and there. Um, I'm hoping to up, uh, release. I've uploaded the song of the, the um, Emma Louise. I'm waiting for Emma Louise to do the artwork. But I don't have a thumbnail, so I really can't play that. But um, that song's uploaded. Um, so I will be releasing it as soon as I have the, um, the artwork for it. Um, Yes, yeah, Southern Rock is another thing that's not nearly Skinner. Uh, Marshall Tucker was a great 30 special. Yeah, you're got, you guys are much better coming up with these. I, I, yeah, uh, Marshall Tucker, uh, who's the uh, Molly Hatchet? Yeah, they would get played all the time. In Indiana, now, see, if you go to a classic rock station in the South, like if you're in Alabama, they're going to be playing Skinner. I guarantee it. Uh, they may not, they won't play Beck. <laughs> they're not going to play. You might hear Beck. Not Jeff Beck, but I'm talking Beck, the L.A. artist. You might hear Beck on a classic rock station or something. Uh, you'll hear him on K-Rock all the time. Uh, and I love Beck. Beck's a freaking art. He's an artist first and then a musician. Um, kind of like Peter Gabriel. I feel the same way about Peter Gabriel. Um, oh, good. Well, good to see you there. I know I'm not. I don't. I'm not playing guitar right now because I'm. We're just finishing up the lesson, so I'm just. We're just talking stuff. Uh, Taj Mahal records, yeah, yeah, yeah. Skinner, Marshall Tucker, 38 Special. 38 Special was huge in Indiana when I was growing up. You know, Hall and Oates was big. That was more pop. The Highwaymen, yeah. So. so, all right, well, listen, I've been on for two and a half hours, which is more than normal. So I should probably hit it. I've got to try to get some work done today. Um, but I will... Um, yeah, it's funny. Adele's cassette tape. You can get Adele's new record on cassette. Um, so I will uh, see you guys next Monday, and I will hopefully be on time. And we will do the last shape, which is the D shape. Okay, so we're going to get the D. Uh, we'll do the minor pentatonic shape over the D scale over the D shape, and the major pentatonic, and then the hybrid. And that will finish that, and then we'll go on from there. I'm not sure what we're going to do, but. Um, uh, uh, we'll we'll fi we'll figure it out. Um, and uh, yeah, so um, anyway, that's it for today. Thank you, Bruce, for moderating. Um, BT Bachman Turner Overdrive, and they did have a few hits, right? Yeah, um, Todd Rundgren's another one. I think Todd Rundgren's a freaking great songwriter. Uh, you don't hear a lot of his music up there, um, but, you know, hello, it's me. ELO is another one that's, like, starting to fade, and I think Jeff Lynn is brilliant. Um, and same with uh, Traveling Wilburys, you know. Um, you don't really hear them as much on classic rock. So, you know, it, it, it's just, it's because there's, they can play, what, 10 songs an hour? So, uh, should, now, the question is, should a radio station have a, Bigger, I, I really I like the end of the year stuff they do where they'll do the top 500 songs of classic top 500 classic songs and they'll start doing that like at Christmas and then they'll play that at the end of the year. That's almost the only time I listen to like 
uh, KLOS because that's, they're doing something like that. And um, you, you hear songs that you haven't heard in a while, you know, because they really, their rotation is probably less than 200 songs. So if they're going to play 500 in a week, um, you're going to hear songs that you haven't heard in a long time. So, um, Oh, you want me to talk about songwriting, Leo? That's an interesting subject. We could go, we could talk about songwriting. Uh, I'm not successful. I guess I'm successful. I don't know. I haven't had a hit, but if I had a hit today, it wouldn't be, a, wouldn't be based on songwriting. <laughs> It would be because if somebody wrote something really happened and, and did some amazing production over the weekend A to Z. Yeah, that was always fun. Yeah, I, I forgot about that. Um, but yeah, it would be so, if I had a hit today, it would be because somebody did some amazing production over one of my guitar hooks, which could happen. A lot of one-hit wonders out there. Yeah, yeah. Top 40, that is the definition of one-hit wonders. Um, but uh, it's less likely now than ever before because re record companies, you know, have a vested interest in keep building those catalogs. Um, they used to do, um, like, I can't, how many times, did, this was awful, how many times did you buy an album because you really liked a song, and you got the album, and it was the only good song on the record? That happened so often to me, I was so mad, and those were the one-hit wonder people, you know, you get the song home, you get the album home, you spent, you know, five, six bucks on an album, and you're like, ah, you know, that was like, that was like four weeks of, of, uh, of uh, four weeks of uh, allowance, you know, I get a dollar a week or whatever. It took me four or five, six weeks to save up enough to buy an album and you buy a record and yeah, I'm live right now. Yeah. <laughs> it's live. Uh, but I'm about to, I'm about to be uh, off right now. I'm about done. So, um, but yeah, how many times did we buy an album and, and get it home? And it was just the one song that we liked and the reason we bought it. I'm trying to think of an example of that. Cause I do have albums still in my collection that are, Part of the, I didn't get rid of them. A lot of K-Rock stuff was like that. A lot of like, one hit, uh, Love and Rockets had a song that was really good and I got the album and it was like, ugh, you know. But then it would be something like Peter Gabriel and every song on the record would be freaking amazing. Um, uh, so yeah, it, so that, they don't do that anymore. That's why they do singles. The record companies will release single, you know, then another single, then another single. And now there's three good songs on a record. People don't buy albums anymore. So, but they will listen to a whole album or they'll pick songs or they'll make, create their own playlists. And uh, so the, the thing is, every song on a record today that a record company releases is got to have something about it that people are going to want to stick into a playlist and get played because that's where everybody makes their money. So a three cat day. Yeah. I need a second coffee. Oh, don't be embarrassed for not understanding English. Um, is that Chinese? I can't, <laughs> I know, uh, I know Shishi, I know uh, uh, Hung Hao, which is very good, very good, Hung Hao, very good. Uh, you know, just from working with a couple of Chinese producers back in the day, or in, not so far back, but you know, they're speaking Chinese, I can't understand a word, and uh, I've done some Korean stuff, Japanese stuff too, and um, sometimes I'm the only white person in the room. <laughs> Oftentimes, when I'm working on records and I'm in a session, I'm the only white guy. <laughs> so and a lot of times, I'm not speaking my language. So I, I speak enough Spanish to kind of get by, but Chinese, yeah. See, hung hao, shishi, ni hao, which is what you say when you answer the phone, ni hao. Um, and then, uh, what is it? Uh, <laughs> maybe I'll tell my wife, uh, see, what is it? Well, I need, which is, I love you. <laughs> That's always good to know. Electric guitar lovers, indeed. So, okay. So, uh, so next week we'll do the last shape songwriting. Uh, Leo, not a bad idea. That could be a long uh, process. And um, I have a lot of do uh, don'ts on songwriting. Uh, do's are, I feel like, we can talk about it. We can talk about styles and things like that. There's so many, yeah. Actually, I love talking about songwriting. I love teaching on it. So, might might be actually a fire under my... Uh, See, um, I, I so I might uh, in two weeks teach on start teaching on songwriting. Okay, all right, we'll talk about it. Um, the only problem is I won't be able to play other people's music, or else I won't be able to monetize this. So 
uh, Joe, thank you for the tip. Um, and you bought my coffee. That was exactly the amount my coffee was. Um, and uh, um, we'll, uh, we'll, I'll see you, Lord willing, <laughs> nine o'clock on Monday next week. Okay. I'm not, I'm still not going to set my alarm. Yeah. If I need to sleep, I'll, I, my body needs sleep. I'm going to take it. So I feel great right now because uh, I, I feel like I got the best sleep I've had in, in weeks. So thank you so much. Guns and Roses. Yes. Yeah. Guns and Roses. Yeah. They get a lot of classic rock play and haven't done anything in a long time. So, all right. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.